From the trenches of Motorsports and Gearhead Central, this is Real Tuners Radio. Your all-motor, boosted, and nitrous-fed hour of power. Now, here's your hosts, the reverends of RPM, the faction of traction, John Buley, Scott Clark, Bill Fowler, Scott Evans, Mark Dahlquist, Mike Perduto, James Short, Tom Sewell, Brian Barnhill. This is Real Tuners Radio. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Real Tuners Radio. Tonight's big topics are how this virus scare is starting to affect drag racing events. This time, it's Hot Rod Magazine's Drag Week and Power Tour that have been axed. Rumor is the Rocky Mountain Race Week organizers are considering another event in lieu of Drag Week. Without a doubt, these are crazy times we are living in. Fear not, we at Real Tuners are still here to host the descent into automotive madness. Thanks for tuning in and welcome to episode 130 of Real Tuners Radio. And welcome back, everybody. How's it going? You're coming at you live, Real Tuners Radio. Uh, man, what a week, what a day. Got up this morning and saw everybody posting about Drag Week being canceled, Power Tours been canceled. Um, I find that interesting since there were no reports of anybody picking up COVID-19 from Rocky Mountain Race Week. But anyway, um, strangely enough, they went ahead and canceled the magazine events. I'm not sure if there was political influence there or what. However, um, let's see. So we got some upcoming classes. You all should check them out. We got unlimited number of seats left for the streaming event. People have started signing up for it. But this coming Saturday and Sunday, we'll be live streaming the class from... Uh, Roy City, Texas, Daniel Raff's shop, Pro Tree Racing. Um, there are still in-person seats. There's a couple of seats available for that as well if you want to show up on site for you Dallas-Fort Worth guys. But if not, for $299, bucks, we are offering a live stream, and I've got my own video production guy here with me tonight kind of testing things out. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's worth checking out the live stream. It's literally going to have full access. We have four camera channels, video of the car, uh, data of the cars, uh, you know, the, the ECU in the car. Um, we're also tuning a wicked, allegedly 3,000 horsepower capable Texas Mile car. Um, guys going for some, some big numbers at Texas Mile, and they want us to tune the car in the class, so they're going to bring it over. Um, a couple of other cars are going to show up that should be pretty cool, too, a little more street-oriented, but should have some neat stuff. Uh, so come check out the class. You can go to realtuners.com. Um, or you can check out the link. It's realtuners.com slash product slash DFW stream. That's for the streaming event or just slash DFW for the class itself. Um, so without further ado, let's bring on the dudes from Ring Central. Mike Perduto, I love your background. Tell us about it. It matches my shirt. Uh, we, it does. Apparently, Ring Central added a thing now where I have a, uh, uh, whatever image or a fake green screen so I can add any picture I want behind me. I won't tell you what other pictures I can add, but at least we have something more uh, professional now than my white wall. This could no go nowhere. Good. That's hilarious. No. Um, another thing real quick while you're wrenching in classes, the guys that are talking about the digital or your online class, do it because he's going to give you backup. You can go and watch it again. And as someone that started in Scott's classes, let me explain to you something. He's going to throw so much information at you in two days, you're going to retain 20, 30%. That sucks. I'm Having the sorry. ability to go back and watch it again is invaluable. I don't, I don't think you guys understand how important, how big of a deal that is. Yeah, we're going to leave it up, and then we're going to let the people who went to the class physically access it as well, and probably the people who went to the other two classes that I've had so far this year, just to see how it turns out. Um, we are going to do some edits and turn that into a webinar-style thing as well. That's kind of plans we have, but... Uh, I've got some help now um, on the video stuff. So, yeah, we're going to try and improve our game on the video on online learning because it appears this COVID-19 thing is killing everybody's business um, through for the rest of the year. So, you know, where I'm at, they're talking about schools not even reopening in the fall. So who knows what the hell is going on? But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of what's happening. So we, we figured doing the online learning thing is probably a good way to go. You know, our buddy Fowler has a bunch of experience with that, too. I don't think he's on yet, and he'll be on here in a while, I'm sure. But anyway, so. 
So, what uh, what else is shaking? You guys, so, what, Drag Week, what's, what's, what are the thoughts on this? Of course, Fowler's not around. He was going for the trifecta this year. He was actually going to try to win Big Block NA class um, at all three of the scheduled events, Rocky Mountain Race Week, Drag Week, and whoa, what was the Midwest? Oh, God, what was Midwest the name of that? Midwest Drags. Da ah, Midwest Drags, Some, and there's Bill. Midwest Drags. Yeah, and, and Bill, of course, went to Rocky Mountain Race Week and handily captured the class win there. Um, so much for Drag Week, man. Bill, what are your thoughts on this? Well, unfortunately, we're seeing the realities of the way that politics are playing out in this country, which is the, and, and I apologize, this is my own personal opinion, does not represent the opinions of real tuners or real tuner sponsors or other participants. Well, we don't have sponsors and we all feel <laughs> the same. We don't have any do. sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot be bought. I can't help it. The it hell? Out of my head. I know, it just goes out of my face. Anyway, the, the bottom line is we're reacting to his there is credible evidence that the numbers are being ginned up and the governments that are in charge places are using this to shut down tracks or threaten track owners and here's here's what the nub of this was and i had a chance to talk to the principals involved is that the track owners were being threatened uh with shutdowns so that you would have the possibility of an event where everybody would convene and then the tracks would not be allowed to open and there'd be sheriffs stationed out front. So in the God. face of that the track owners and the organizers, they don't have much of a choice. Um, so, and, and I know this for a fact that the people that run and manage and organize this event, were doing everything they possibly could to make this happen. And there was simply no way to get it done because no tracks, no event, um, and if the tracks can't get permission to open or get their operating permits pill pulled, uh, what are they supposed to do? So this is the reality that we are living in currently. And so it completely sucks. Um, those of you that have followed some of the posts on Facebook and other places have noticed that Matt Frost, who did successfully run Rocky Mountain Race Week a couple of weeks ago, uh, is looking at doing a not drag week substitute event uh, during the same period the drag week was scheduled for. And as of this moment, I can't tell you whether that's going to happen or not, but I know that an awful lot of us are pulling for that to happen. We'll do everything we can to do to support it. Yep. Adam so, Dory's in here listening line. too. Sorry. I just wanted to give a shout out to Adam Dory. He Go assisted ahead. a lot with the, uh, with the online and media stuff on, on Rocky mountain race week and, as he pointed out, Rocky Mountain Not to Race Week has announcing the entire thing. Fi yeah, <laughs> five hundred plus drivers and co-drivers, zero reported cases so far. It'd be cool if Matt can pull off another drag and drive event in September. I'll announce again if we can pull it off. Adam, I'll I'll be there. I'll I'll find a way to ride around and follow on that one. It's been three years since I've done Race Week, and it's I miss it. That's one of the coolest events, and you just made yourselves a thousand times cooler with what you guys did this year. So thank you, and we will support you one hundred and ten percent. Badass. Good to see all you guys here tonight. Lee Connor, Khalil Bax. Good to see him from the class. Um, Bear. Hilarious. He pointed out that if you do the live stream, you don't get the lunch. Truth be told, the lunch we had at the Florida class was the best one we've ever had. Not going to lie. Um, we had Chef Tony Cater on site, and it was off the chain good. It was worth it. It's expensive, but it was worth it. Scott Dawson. Yeah, but if, see you. if you do the live stream, you can get whatever food you want for lunch instead of whatever is provided. Oh, so if, yes. if it makes Throws it better, you can just, uh, you can shoot Scott some money. I'm sure he'll randomly pick a nice uh, Uber Eats or Grubhub for you. <laughs> Dude, that'd be the way to do it right there. You don't know what I'm going to say. Yeah, you don't even have to make a decision. Just, you know, hey, I kind of like this. Pick me something. <laughs> you have no idea what I might send over. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse oh, we Coburn, had sauteed up, scallops with green beans and risotto, saffron risotto tonight, which I cooked. Ah, and our crazy. goddaughter, Bella, who's living this with us because her school is shut down. Uh, she works at a seafood place, and so she brings us the really good stuff right off the boat. So Bella, I remember her from, I met her a long time ago when she was a youngster, like five or six years ago. Oh, cool. yeah. Now now she's all grown up 18-year-old. Nice. So, yep. yeah. Yeah. Good seeing you guys. Nick Deal, good to see you guys. My buddies from Michigan are on here. Greg Breton's on here tonight. Joey Tarpeo, my dudes from the 
Missouri, St. Louis area. Good stuff, man. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty stoked. Morgan Brittenham's on here. That guy's, you're a troublemaker, Morgan, but we like following you because you are M1 entertaining mofo. Good seeing all these guys. Eric Evans is on. Man, all these guys are on here tonight listening. There must not be shit going on anywhere else. Man. <laughs> Can't possibly be that we're that entertaining. <laughs> it's just, you don't have to. Okay, it's like when you're camping. I, I give this example all the time. You don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun the other campers. Think about how many other podcasts started at the same time we did and, and are no longer around. Um, in fact, who was it? James Shower, uh, Build Tune Race. He's He started the same week we did three years and two months ago, and he's still doing his thing, man. In fact, he just moved. He moved up to uh, Quad Cities in Davenport. He's going to be motion race work social media. I, he's been for a while behind their social media stuff. But anyway, he's good to see. I, I like James because he's done build tune race for three years steady. And he's another one of those guys. He's not being bought out by sponsors and he just shares what he knows and he's not shoving BS in your face. It's good stuff. So what else is going well, obviously on? a talented guy? Cause that brand has grown and grown and grown. So yep. good for him. Clearly. Yeah, Adam Dory, we hope you can get it done too, man. I don't know how we can help you, but if we can help you uh, get another event going here, uh, let us know how we can get behind that, man. Because that would be that would be bitching. I'd like to we can certainly it. promote it when it becomes when it becomes you know if it if it becomes reality. And uh, Matt and Adam, if you're listening again, Bill Fowler here. I've already posted that we will once again be the internet sponsor for the live feed if that's part of the deal or whatever else we can do to help is Big Hat Racing. So we're there right with you, whatever else you need to get done. I would help stream that if they wanted to. If they wanted to stream, that would be a fun thing to do. I know Chad's got that mostly covered, but if they wanted some help, I'd be all over that. I'd like to help Adam. That would be cool. I've never met him in person. I've known Matt for years, but very cool. So what else is shaking? Um, Power Tour, did anyone care that, that that got shut down? Or and I'll be honest, it, Power Tour is like, like, like I get the gay hot rodder thing. It's like Jag Week Light, but I had a lot of fun on Power Tour, man. I really had a lot of fun. I met a bunch of, I got to race Jay Leno across a bridge in Philadelphia. You know, like, like it was a good time. You know what I mean? Right. I'm, I'm sure it's Power a good Tour time. is a good time. We did it in 2018 um, with a, a great group of folks. We took my buddy Carl, Carl, who was my co driver at, Rocky Mountain Race Week, who now understands what the reality of endurance drag racing events are like. Um, but we did Rocky or uh, Power Tour in 2018. We had a ball. We took this Pro Street car. Oddly enough, we had fuel heating issues. So we went through about, I don't know, 50 bags of ice on that trip. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess that's a problem for us, you know, spoiled Californians who never deal with <laughs> weather. Um, but the bottom line is it's a good deal, it's, it's a different event. Yeah, you know, it's sort of like um, people are going to get mad at me, but Power Tour is, you know, a roving, moving car show. It's a lot of fun. You get to get out, you get to drive, you see wonderful parts of the country. Um, Drag Week or Rocky Mountain Race Week or Midwest Drags, when it happens again, adds the element of you actually have to beat on your shit and you actually have to make it get from the next place to the next place. And that adds a significant other element to it. So, Mike, when did you do it? I long hauled 05, 09, and I think 13. I have all the, I have all the, the street signs in the garage. I, can go, I know 05 for sure. I know 09 for sure. It was either 13 or 14. I'd have to go pull the signs in the garage. So, for those of you who don't know the language, long haul means you did the entire drive. Which is crazy. Um, um, I think 18, the full drive, I don't know what the mileage was. I think it was seven or 800 or something like that. Um, back in 2001, I did the long haul in my 71 convertible where we started in Detroit and finished in San Bernardino. That was 20 some hundred miles. Uh, so it was, but it was still a ball, uh, rain, yeah. shine. We just kept moving. So Oh yeah, four or oh, oh five was Milwaukee to Kissimmee, so literally Great Lakes, yeah, Great Lakes all the way down to south of Orlando, straight through. Well, you know, through, over the five days, and 
once again, one of the most fun times I've ever had in my life. Yeah, I think the great thing about uh, Power Tour is we got to have great meals at every stop. Yes. We, 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 we searched it out. We science it out from Gator Barbecue uh, in Alabama. I mean, every, every place we went, people that were locals clued us in on where to go and get a great meal. And we just had a ball. So it's a bummer that it's done too. And it was also going to be, had been relocated already to September. And I don't know if any, everybody's been watching, but other events in other sports and other things have been canceled all the way up to and including the Rose Bowl parade, which is January of 2021 was officially canceled today. Um, I know most of the people that listen to this podcast probably don't give a shit about stick and ball sports, uh, but that's, that's a, uh, predictor of the fact that basically college football is going to go away um for this fall and a lot of the other things that we're all sort of used to and see and watch especially in parts of the country where you can't drive your cars in the winter so that's yeah we we have more disruptions left to come unfortunately the sad thing i mean the bigger thing there is if if that big of an event and that big of an industry is still canceling that's whether it's political pressure or just everyone falling in line because they don't want to be, be the ones doing something different to get sued. Um, that's just going to trickle down to every other event. So it is a significant possibility. This is not news and I'm not reporting it as such, but it's legitimately possible that the NHRA will not be able to finish out their season. And that's a result of the same issue with tracks that Drag Week is encountering. Remember, we're, we're here in July. We're talking about events in September. And a lot of these tracks are facing the same issue, whether it's the NHRA. And a lot of people don't know this, but the NHRA, um, their TV deal is they pay to be on TV. This, this is reasonably well known. I'm not giving away anything. And therefore, what makes NHRA works is the gate at the national events. And if they don't have that, that's a problem and it's a problem for the tracks that are nhra tracks that depend on having one or two of those events a year as well gainesville Gainesville here in florida has almost no events except for gator nationals yeah so this this is going to affect track owners everywhere and it will have an ugly trickle down effect to you know all of the division races and all the other things so look at your local track schedule and a lot of folks will realize that even though they may not participate in those. That's also a significant part of their local tracks revenues for running those division races and those things. So this is a big deal. And I think the only thing all of us can do is wherever possible, support those events. If you're so inclined, and I think more of us need to be, go to your local city councils, go to your local board of supervisor, go to your county, whatever, and say, we want to keep these events open. We can be social distancing as appropriate we can do whatever because if we're the part of the problem then we're also going to be part of why some of these things get shut down as the nannies and the scaredy cats and everything else become ascendant i don't think any of us want that so now let's talk about converting from pump gas to no go ahead no no sema and pri no way are they going to have those yeah. Man, don't tell me that. Please don't tell me that. No way are they I can't have see those. SEMA, man. I can't see enough companies wanting to be able to be there. No, and- dude, Shannon Davis is one of the smartest dudes I know at this stuff. And he was saying, hey, look, man, there's enough companies are hurting that they want to pull anyway. Uh, everybody's tentative. It doesn't work if everybody's tentative. I'd like to get, I need to get him back on to talk about that because he had some, some pretty good logic there. But anyway... Ah, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? So, I doubt they're going to have SEMA and PRI with as close quarters as people are there. And dudes, it's all run by, I mean, you're talking politics. It's all run by liberal dudes. All those marketing guys go join that SEMA marketing page. Everybody's talking let's about their design of masks. <laughs> if they pull 20, 25% of the attendees for PRI out, they might actually all fit in the convention center they're in. <laughs> right. Oh, they might. Oh my God. I mean, if they want to, if they want to cut PRI's attendance down based on COVID, all they have to do is like actually check the people coming in and make sure yes. they're actually industry. Yes. Uh, yeah, like that's gonna happen. You can't sell a lot of drinks. With guidelines. 
you can't sell a bunch of drinks with with freaking only industry people showing up. No, oh, I, I think you underestimate the ability of industry people to drink. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Dude. yeah. Uh, on on the other hand, hey, uh, drinking. It's interesting. Jamie Meyer is now the president of PRI, so um, it's going to be very interesting to see how someone who has that, you know, GM level corporate experience, uh, you know, ran all all you know, which you have to sales for supporting grassroots racing and you know the ls you know phenomenon and all of that so i think this is a pretty smart guy it'll be interesting to see what they do to adapt to a situation where yeah they're going to be a lot fewer companies that are ultimately going to make the decision to show or send a lot of people and so it may look like 2008 2009 2010 you know the the shows the shows scaled way back then and then they grew back up so you know, none of us are in charge of that. We'll have to see what the people that are you know, pulling the strings do. But ultimately, unfortunately, big events with tons of people in confined spaces are going to be the last things that come back. So I, I, I'm not smart enough to say at this point. Yeah, I can tell you without a doubt that my job is one of the is in an industry that is crippled right now by this entire thing, right? We rely on massive crowds for every single thing we do in the music business. It's, it's unbelievably crippling to us, considering that basically 95% of all people in the entertainment industry are sitting at home indefinitely until things clear up. Yeah. So, can I go on a rant for a split second? Uh oh, is this you're gonna light Bewley on fire? Go ahead. A, l- a little bit because it's something that bothers him too. But it, it's a little bit of anything for everybody. When did and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this to drag racers. That's the majority of who I deal with. When did everyone become such a pussy? I, right. If, if this is not your world, if you want to get in this world and you want to play in this world, and I, I'm getting this because I got messages the other day because. Me and another local guy, and it's purely joking around. We were talking about racing car versus car. It's like, dude, your shit's slow, blah, blah, blah. It's typical banter. And you get these PMs behind closed doors. Yo, like, do you and -and so-and-so really not like each other? Uh, um, A good answer, me and Capizzi. Jonathan Mike Capizzi. Everyone knows Capizzi. He holds the stock bottom end 5-3 record. Jonathan, yeah. Dude, nice. I met him at LS Fest. I met him at – or I talked to him again at PRI. Super nice guy. But I'll joke with him online. Your car's a dud. We're going to run that record over. It's just banter and joking. It's not real, people. And you get these messages. You must really hate Capizzi. No, actually, I really like the guy. But I can make fun of his car because that's what we do. If, if this stuff bothers you, sell your car and go buy something else. Get out of this industry and get away from us, please. Sorry, that was my... Uh... <laughs> yeah. So it's like when you see a show car and it's got one little speck of dirt. You you screw with the guy and go, when are you going to give that thing a car wash? Yes, it's no different. I, and that's, I knew John because John gets over there and gets all fired up with people in the background. It's like, you know, because John gets labeled an asshole. And half the time, he's not being an asshole. He's just telling you the truth. Let's be real. But have some thick skin. Be able to take a joke without just thinking everyone hates you. It's, it, we don't hate you. We're not doing this on – like it's – it's a joke. Calm down. It'll be okay. I promise you. You'll survive the heat tomorrow. It's not even that people need to have thick skin. It's the fact that they need to have any skin at all. <laughs> because you can literally say something that is emotionally neutral, and they you they act like you insulted their mother. They get all offended because you didn't kiss their ass enough when you on the delivery of whatever it was that you told them. Like two people you need to have a transaction that's emotionally neutral. Like you if you don't if you don't build them up enough and prop them up enough about what you're doing and what you're doing for them. Matt then Frost you summed get, it like, up. Like, people are soft. <laughs> they are. Yep. They are. You hurt my Dude, it's beyond, soft. it's beyond soft at this point. It's I would never be- insult somebody's mother. She was hot in the sack. <laughs> oh, <Jesus. laughs> 
Ah, uh, Bill's drinking. Great. It's funny because I already will talk your shit. Has anybody but... here ever worked in a mechanic shop before? <laughs> no, I, I, dude, I've I mean, never worked yeah, in an yeah, IT department up. before. Hold on, man. Hold on. Shut up. Oh, yeah. Shut yeah. up. Damn it. Tonight's inebriation, sponsored by Will Tetra. Thank you. <laughs> you still have some left? Mary drank all mine. <laughs> yeah. And that, that, that's what? Christmas? It's Christmas 2018. Oh, yeah. I still got some. I like it. I like it a lot. But, yeah, that's my, that's my thing lately. You guys need to nut up a little. Oh, one more. If you message somebody, and I'm going to assume, I'm, I'm going to leave the tuning aspect out because usually what you get is, hey, man, I'm becoming a big-time guy in my area. Will you tune my shit for free and I'll put your sticker on my car? If you have to ask for a free part or a free tune or a free something, you're not at the level of getting anything for free yet. So just stop. <laughs> when you go fast ask. enough and when you've done enough, they'll, they'll, they'll bring it to you, I promise. You won't have to ask for it. That is very well put. Yep. 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 You, yep. Yeah. If you I don't think to, uh, if you have to precursor your question with, you know, you give you something for free with how many Instagram followers you have and the fact that you're you're kind of a big deal or some shit like that. <laughs> no. Based on your Instagram you, score. You, yeah. That not happening. Jay, I don't know, man. Maybe it's the alcohol. Jack Daniels, it's the whiskey. Does something to me. I felt like actually turned the video camera on for once. I don't know. Well, like when you finally do dumb stuff when you're out drinking just because you got alcohol in your system? <laughs> I do not require alcohol to do dumb stuff. I was about to say well, the same I mean, thing. Dumber stuff? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should. I did. Uh, just all oh, the level it sure of helps, what are you All right. We should have YouTube back online. Sorry, everybody bitching about YouTube, but I started a new stream on YouTube and it's called the same thing. Episode 130. Dumb stuff when sober reduces the uh, reduces the uh, the chances of law enforcement being involved. Alcohol greatly increases that chance. <laughs> That's usually the only difference. Oh, man. Scott, I'm liking all these multiple views of your studio set up there. That's awesome. Thanks, man. <laughs> We're just playing around with video production here a little bit, getting ready for this uh, live streaming thing. I've even got my. Uh, yeah, it's it's did very you guys, nice. Have you guys seen the uh, the Dan turn on turn on my uh, main camera over here, Jason? See if I can see this. This Dan Parker pen right here. So this looks like a. This is the new executive pen he's got. It's bigger diameter, dude. That's all billet aluminum that's been anodized. Like all the everything on here, it looks kind of like it might be soft and rubbery. It's not. It's like super massive. This is the ride along pen. I like it. 153 mile an hour in the car with Dan Parker. Um, I'm super proud of this and it writes awesome. But anyway, I just got it. I, it took a roundabout way of getting to me in the mail. It was pretty funny. It went to the old address and got stuck in the mail. It took like an extra three months to get here, but I just got it the other day and this thing is badass. I love this pen. Like it's better than the other ones. Highly recommend checking out his executive pens. But anyway, yeah, thanks for the compliments on the studio, man. That's uh, We're just playing around with the video switcher here. And we got like the porno LED lights in the background, different colors, which it turns out they flicker and they freak out my mouse, my wireless mouse. But anyway. Right. Hey, don't make me find some porno music. <laughs> I think YouTube is just gone and dead. YouTube died? Yeah, YouTube died. There was problems. It was bitching about the feed from Restream or something. And I keep hearing is it like I keep hearing it's like someone turns a shower on. I think that's an Evans background. I doubt it. I don't know. It sounded like your background. Anyway. What was it? So is there I've, I've been YouTube muted stream? until like three seconds ago. Gotcha. So no. yeah, this, it looks like you got the second stream going, but it says chat is disabled for this live stream. So I don't know. Uh, if let me go that, try and find it. There's definitely it. a second stream happening. I'm working on it. Sorry. It was oh, that one ju it just ended. So it'll, 
Yep, it literally just ended again. There's a problem with YouTube and Restream tonight. Sorry, folks. Listen to us on Facebook. Ah, the Facebook numbers grew. Dude, so we will do Road Week along with this if we get it done. It's kind of a power tour. Matthew Frost. Matthew Frost, the creator of Rocky Mountain Race Week and the only event promoter with with a pair, uh, is listening to us tonight. And I, I, I'm just going to go ahead and talk about this a second, Matthew. I don't mind. I hope you don't mind if I riff on this a little bit. But um, Road Week is is fucking cool. I'm just going to say bad words. Um, I don't have a car. I tune everybody else's junk. Um, but I still like to go on these events. I've actually done two road weeks on Rocky Mountain Race Week. Uh, but pretty much the coolest thing I've done because, I, I mean, besides the fact that they uh, they give the racers more time, it's more of a racer-oriented event, um, you get to kind of take time to stop and see the sights. They take you on. Bill, I'm presuming that you went on the same breathtaking mountain drives this year as they do every year. Did you get some really cool two-lane highway drives through the mountains? Everything was gorgeous, two-lane highway. I mean, everywhere, including, you know, places in western Colorado or east, whatever, eastern Colorado that looked just like Kansas, looked just like Nebraska. But the route was awesome. I, I can't say enough good things about the route. Um, the mountain stuff, our car was horrifically underprepared for the mountain stuff because of our fuel heat issue. But uh, the bottom line was it was an awesome event, and I look forward to the next one whether it's September or next year. Yeah, they're saying Facebook feed having issues now. Yeah, that's what Jason was yeah, just I'm, I'm looking at a frozen picture of Scott looking <laughs> with his like arms he's casting up. I know, a spell look at that. He does, look at that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> doing, <laughs> doing gangster hands. Gangster hands. I don't know what's going on. It's something between Restream and those two providers. I think Restream's taking a crap. Um we can just well, we're it recording early. it, so we can always upload it later. Yeah. yeah, keep recording it. Let's just pretend. I'll just go ahead and record it and keep going. Yeah, Restream is jacked. It's Because uh, I've got good packets, no packet loss from here to Restream, but then both YouTube and Facebook stream health is showing horrible. So, can, I see Brian pretty good right this second. I'm not sure what the, lay, the latency is. Can we do audio only and make it work for everybody who's trying to at least listen? I don't think no, so. because it still anything. transmits video even if you turn it off. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I could, I can kill video going out if they want to. I, well, I didn't really. know if it was a bandwidth you issue could, or what the deal was. You could go to black screen, and that would be less bandwidth than multiple colors and multiple things going on. But it's not drastic difference. It's a small, small difference. Done. Went to black screen right there. <clears throat> I don't know. I'm asking if they can still hear us. No, it looks like it's buffering and all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's doing lots of shit. Yeah, no, they can hear us. We're okay. Getting, we're getting responses that it's good that it's going. It's and coming I'm back. seeing video yep. of y'all making fun of Scott's thriller stand. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that second. what that is? Oh, that's funny shit. That's what the, you thriller you got moves. frozen totally doing the fucking th doing mid thriller. Right. And then, Woo, and then check uh, it out. Rocky Mountain Race Week is this awesome. <laughs> right. Right. Hilarious. Yeah, it is yeah. hilarious. My funny. Facebook feed is showing just like one frame every minute or something weird. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really, really weirdly jacked. Sorry. They say the audio is working, so hopefully everybody can hear us. Audio is good, so don't stress that. All right, cool. Well, fuck it. I, it's something with Restream. They're having problems there. If I stop it, though, it kills everything. So we just got to keep going. Oh, anyway. And we're recording uh, it. So. One day, Bewley decides to be on cam. Yeah, his. <laughs> I'd see the implication there. He That's his. It. See, this is the reason why uh, I don't it. get on video. My ugly <laughs> fucking mug done broke every goddamn time. That's what. Don, you, you, you need a background, John. Stay off the camera. That's what, you, you, need, you wonder why I stay off the camera. This is why. This is you why. Need, you need a background, John. You got to get yourself a background. Yeah, John, you need a background. I mean, Perduto is making us all look bad with his new whatever that is. Oh. Uh, uh, Perduto's just fucking special. Come on. It was Clark's I mean, idea. I just I, didn't do that. I just said check it out. But it looked good because it worked best on his background because he had the most common color background for the keyframe or the I'm just waiting until we all try to find a nice white background so we can just see who comes up with the most uh retarded uh, going, background this, picture. This is going to turn out well. I can see how this is going to go already, Barnhill. 
it's, it's going to turn into a it's going to turn into a dick measuring contest. Oh yeah, but who mean, can do the most fucked up background? <laughs> and it's not going to be like who can do like who can well, be on Jupiter or who can be on Mars. It's going to be some weird shit. <laughs> somebody's going to doll quest is even on here tonight. Have, like I, he's going to have some awesome meme background or something. Yeah. yeah, right. When he Somebody, it out. one of us is going to do some crazy shit, like overlay some porno from 1964 or some. Crap. Whoa, whoa, John! Like, Ooh, that's that'll be the, that'll be the funny of it. You know, it'll be playing in the fucking background and crap. It'll be hilarious, black and white and everything. Some of our audience will be introduced to the existence of pubic hair, which they've never actually seen before. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of it. We don't even 60s. have backgrounds, and this is already derailing the whole show. <laughs> right? Like, uh. that, but but I can, that's that's the whole point. That's we need to call hilarious. this like foolproof radio or something, man. So someone else gets the fucking lawyer letters for once. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what the fuck, Amber? <laughs> <laughs> uh. Nobody gonna get the fucking lawyer any fucking lawyer letters over that shit. Oh no, that never's happened. That's never gonna happen. <laughs> uh, that sounds like a challenge to me. Don't get me started. Oh, I challenge you to get yeah, anyway. Sorry, no one's gonna beat me at that game. But anyway. <laughs> Not quiet. over talking about about vintage porn we're gonna get a fucking lawyer letter when we're talking about vintage porn oh my god i gave you guys a little nitrous explosion back there so you got something to look at for a while that is awesome that was sweet i don't know what that was but that was cool looking for a second that's the hood scoop about six foot in the fucking air hey if you haven't launched a carburetor hood scoop into the stands at least once have you even tuned a nitrous car apparently not no because (laughs) i don't tune stars (laughs) <laughs> so so mike um that was not black nasty at least from the picture it didn't look like it was black nasty so no that's that was, some picture i just randomly found on google real fast yeah i like it that 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 now now that we realize you have an active background yeah you have really thrown down the gauntlet <laughs> Sorry, my, my dogs are having a problem man now you need to make like a video background like playing video in the back i mean you, i don't know if you can do that on uh, ring central but i can do it with obs studio we're working on it i want a video of will doing the hula dance in a grass skirt yes oh fire that up <laughs> william tetro if you are out there somebody send it to me and i'll play it i want i want a video of will doing the hula dance in a grass skirt and a coconut bra and that that can be that can be mike's background video (laughs) (laughs) nasty (laughs) nasty hell that's just funny it is funny technical question why does this happen all the time to nitrous cars inquiring minds want to know um nitrous sucks (laughs) (laughs) why you gotta go there bro (laughs) most most times it's going to be one of two things. Either A, not enough heat in the motor to swallow the quantity of fuel and oxidizer we're shoving down its throat. Or B, we didn't get our phasing right or our distributors off. And because you got to think we make a swing from, say, 32 degrees to I've had cars that leave in the negative timing numbers off the starting line. And you have to have that distributor phase correctly. Otherwise, you bang the wrong hole at the wrong time and things get really out of whack. Those would be your two not biggest night just backfires. Yeah, not enough RPM to swallow what you're throwing at it. Stuff along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it it's what makes street outlaws and shows like that interesting. You know, I think this one's going to blow up. You know, that's the only side bets we were only interested in. I'm a it's firm believer that the majority the of those they shove fireworks in the tailpipes because I haven't. I've been around some nitrous cars. I've blown some shit up in my day. I've never seen sparklers come out of the tailpipes. Like the shit they pull off, I've never seen no shit like that before. Like it, it's the shit I'm, coming out of the pipes and all the tips to all their spark plugs. Yeah, but they got like thirty of them coming out of each side. Like I don't know how they pull that off. It's that's not. It's because they show you four different camera shots of the same sixty <laughs> feet of road, so you see it four times for every time it comes out. Is that while they're playing the F one car noises? So, so there's yeah, while they're, they're playing the fake really noises and fake squeals, came out. Mm-hmm. yeah, 
The, the other thing that can get you is if you get fuel puddling up in the intake and you get a little bit of a backfire that comes up and it ignites the whole thing. Yes. And what most people don't understand, a lot of times if the throttle hangs and it bangs, it'll knock the carb or the top of the intake manifold and it'll actually stick wide open. So it'll bang, you'll think the car shut off and randomly about five or 10 seconds later, you get another bang. So you gotta, <laughs> yeah, you gotta be on your game with the nitrous cars. Gotta know what you're doing. They'll only swallow so much, man. Breaking <laughs> news, Buley replied to a Snapchat. Uh-oh. And you yes, on Snapchat? Coil on plug is the way to go with big nitrous all day, every day. But the majority of the guys that are running nitrous are old school and they don't want to do it because they don't understand it. Coil on plug is where it's at as long as you're triggering everything properly. If you gotta yes. <laughs> there are systems out there that every firmware update is like Russian roulette. But um if you got something solid triggering your coils, that's the way to get way to go, no doubt. So while we're on update that, how many people list. do a firmware update with zero backup of any of their old firmware or their map at all? All of them. All of them. It's, yeah. yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> no, and I, how many people are dumb enough to do a firmware update at the track before their first pass? Oh, me. I do it, but I only want to known conditions, but I also back <laughs> everything up. <laughs> and, and only if it's to benefit in some way that's, oh, we do need this for this race. Oh, you know, yeah. if it's a specific... Yeah function never never if it's if it's already good to go and we're ready to race and there's no benefit to upgrading the firmware to something new don't, and do, don't it. do it if, if the benefits of of whatever they're saying is new and improved if it doesn't benefit you directly you don't need to do the update yeah i actually had an emergency call from a guy over the weekend because uh, uh had his a uh, uh, special little uh homemade type ecu that a lot of guys use and he had it set to automatically downward download firmware updates, and it completely broke his comms um, and deleted the tune that he had zero backups of of, of anything. Oh man! So you got to don't no God don't flash your firmware if you don't have the tune on the laptop. I won't even flash yeah, the firmware no. if I don't have the old firmware to reinstall to go back to. But that's my IT yep, background. Yeah, always, always yeah. be able to go it, go but one hundred percent back. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Not some to stories. mention like any upgrade. I want to find out that other people that I have confidence in have done the firmware upgrade and it didn't blow crap up before I'm gonna download it because I am not the most competent IT professional in the world and I don't wanna find out that it blew up the comms or it did something else and I'm not gonna notice until um spark plugs are coming out the tailpipe. So Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. like it, it changed so, the way a setting worked or something like that. I don't know what your best software update story is, but mine was uh, I pretty much ruined an Olympics almost in 1996 by being a young dipshit <laughs> doing software updates. It's a it's a long story, but yeah, it was a, I didn't ruin the Olympics, but I ruined everybody's ability to buy tickets, and I fucked up a lot of. It wasn't my fault entirely. I was doing what a what the bank what was it Nations Bank, and I was in charge of uh, the ticketing systems, and they. What happened? Oh, they they were updating their software, and they sent me an update on my end, and this was all Unix-based stuff in 1995, and uh, hilarious. They had me send all the credit card deposits like six or seven times because they claimed they were trying to get things right on their end, and this is like midnight. I come in late for this to supervise this, and and the next morning I get a call at like 8 a.m. from the guy that manages the call center that's selling tickets for the upcoming biggest Olympics in the world, which I think it still was the biggest. There was 14 and a half million butts in seats. And anyway, apparently, like, people got charged, like, five or six times for their ticket packages, and we are not talking cheap, chicken, cheap tickets. Like, each ticket to the closing ceremonies is, like, $900. So some people were accidentally charged, like, $7,000, and it ran their bank. You know, they were using debit cards, and it ran their bank into the negatives. Oh, it was a huge freaking nightmare. But that was my lesson on not just trusting a manufacturer when they tell you to do a software or firmware update. Um, I just, it just reminded me that I talk about some stress. I thought I was going to get shit canned. I didn't, but it was, I learned my lesson. So I've not had many cases where that's been a problem with the, uh, car thing. Carry on. Didn't mean to get off track there. It just reminded me hey, of that. Dirk, nit nitrous is the best power adder. So it's not just fun. <laughs> There's a gorilla's <laughs> balls in your background, dude. What are you doing? <laughs> are you aware of this? Uh... <laughs> 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 I, I have to note that 
that oh. I didn't see that picture. I have to note that Keith Turk is on here tonight, and I know that Keith has had one of the less wonderful days of his life as they had to announce that Drag Week was shut off, and everybody everywhere promptly messaged Keith about oh, I'm what sure. is it, what's going on, and why isn't this happening? He must have got 10,000 messages today on changed Facebook. The world. Yeah, yeah. I assume his phone literally just melted into a puddle right in front of him. So, Keith, <laughs> cool to have you on here, man. Good to have you, Keith. Uh, I'm sure you're looking forward to going to the salt. And I hope to God you guys get to go to the salt because I haven't heard anything about that. But talk about a place where you naturally can social distance. Jesus, Bonneville. But, you know, let us know if there's anything up with uh, land speed racing or those events. Oh, Christ, I'm seeing Perduto's picture now. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so it was perfect. I looked over right at the Ring Central screen, and that's all I saw. <laughs> um, got a question. Are there limitations to using a dual-sync distributor for cam and crank trigger? That's Rich Pedraza. I typed the answer. Hey, cheap ass. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good idea, man, that the, I've had problems with some of the, the – Popular manufacturer dual sinks. Am I treading carefully enough here? Um, the, Can we uh, say it's cool for a low horsepower street car street rod? Street rod, yeah, I would think so. Something I was going to race? No. Not yeah, I mean, I regardless of it just being that mechanical setup not being the most accurate, you're already not measuring your crank angle. You're you're, you're inferring your crank <laughs> angle, which yeah, it's a mechanical gear, but yeah. you're still you're building some. Time and uh, chain uncertainty slop. into that whole thing. Yep. thing. yep. I'm reminding Rich that the setup he has already has a 36 minus one oh. wheel tucked in behind the damper. Just so he the, can run a just cherry just sensor on that for, for the, the crank. But then, yeah. Perfect. Yep. He says they're getting ready for El Mirage. Are they going to have El Mirage? Ugh, it's California. Oh my God. It's, it's, it was 129 yesterday at um Ooh. death valley which is not overly far from el mirage nope um so uh yeah uh it's been dry in the state now for four months and so el mirage should be wonderful <laughs> good luck keith good luck to you guys run an air filter oh dude so i my story i think i got videos of this somewhere but Bonneville, the, him and Freiberger, they ran that motor without an air filter and it spun the car and it literally had like an inch of dust sitting on the throttle blades. Freiberger just hits it with some carb cleaner and sucks it through the motor. Yowza. Ooh. Oh, yeah. God. Ring seal. Who needs it? <sighs> November, he says. God, that's that's so called uh, lapping the valves. Right. Yeah. <laughs> lapping the rings and everything else. No, it was ugly. El Mirage dust is nasty, and it's real fine silt. It's really rough on your lungs. Ugh. Been there. I have to put new filters in anything I take there immediately after going out to any event. Um, I worked patrol for quite a number of years with gear vendors and literally drive out there with the truck, have a new filter with me to put in after I get off of the road leaving the event. It's that bad. Sorry. It looks like all of our tape stuff has come back. Everyone can hear everything's starting yeah. to pop back up again. Yeah, I'm sitting here answering questions from Lee Connor about he's asking about on Rocky Mountain Race Week this year. Saw a lot of YouTubers entering and filming how they got on. I suppose a question for Matt is that something he would like to see a lot more of as more coverage to help bring in more the following year. Lee, I'm gonna say Matt couldn't give a rat's ass about how many people show up. He puts on the event for the racers. They don't bring in magazines. You're not likely to be a, a video superstar. Um, it's really an experience you got to do. It's not if you're into self-marketing or you think you want to get a, a car spot. If you're the guy that bitches about, I didn't, I just got a postage stamp in the magazine this year. I hate you, Hot Rod. That's your, the Mac Wreck Mountain Race Week isn't for you. Um, if you like cars, you like racing and you like endurance drag racing and you're a bit of a masochist and, and, and want to punish yourself, um, the, the Rocky Mountain Race Week is for you, and if you want to meet a lot of really good, genuine people, Rocky Mountain Race Week is for you. It's not a publicity thing, you know. I mean, maybe it is a little more. Cletus is going there, and 
whatever, the Taylor family, some of them showed up. But I, for the most part, it's not about, you know, people who were like, oh, look at my YouTube count. Look at my blah, blah, blah. Check me out. My YouTube Yeah, I guess that depends on, on who the YouTube guy is, too, because there's some guys out there that are legit car guys and, you know, they're just filming. Oh, and I'm fine with do. that. That is awesome. Doing their own stuff. Cool. I was just saying his question was, yeah. does Matt like that to bring more people in? I don't think Matt cares. I, he's busy making sure everybody has a cool event and a cool experience. Yeah, like if a guy's doing it and it's cool and he's filming it because it's this cool thing he gets to do, sweet. If they're yes. doing it as just a content creator, as some fluff and well said. Then expecting something because of it, yeah. You know, if you're going for the right reason, absolutely awesome to see coverage of it. If you're doing it as a marketing stunt, that's not what the event's about. Keith, you know, something I would like to see. Sorry. Because what Matt just said, the more something, generations that something get involved, I the better. And I, I think that's a good point. Like, especially the, the, the guys, you know, five, 10 years younger than me and back, especially are like so caught up on like everything these YouTube guys do. Like I have good friends that are, uh, you know, have 10, 20,000 YouTube followers. One of which is does winding road stuff. And the others, a uh, uh, drift guy that just films cool stuff he does. And we'll get those kids that come up at events and we'll want to talk like we were at a pro FD event or pro FD drivers around these kids went over and talked to my buddy and asked for his autograph. And he's like, I don't know what to fucking do. I just filmed the dumb shit. I do sign it. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the, one of the things I'd like to see more at events and I realize this isn't always possible because some places are kind of close to airports or ne near military bases and they have restricted airspace things. I would love to see more drone coverage drone at footage. some of these events yes. because the overhead oh, view yeah. is awesome. It, it and I realize it's not always possible, but yeah. the track owners can probably find out if they can get the okay to do it in their area and find a guy who is reputable and, and decent and is polite and can, can do the video for them that they could do pretty regular the guys who do that it makes the event so much better for guys who can't go because then you can see the things at a view you haven't usually got to see and it's better than that static fixed thing where unfortunately sometimes their camera positioning can't be ideal they True. they have to sit where they have to sit Absolutely. sometimes you know maybe there's maybe there's a sign in the way or there's something you know three the three angles you see are kind of far away because just the nature of how they have to do it so, yeah, so sometimes that extra camera angle makes a huge difference the, the drone thing isn't really that hard and that's one thing where i'll say and i don't know if it's just because there's a bunch of guys that waste money on stuff and drifting already but that's one thing we have drone footage of almost even small events all the time fd did it um, and it's, I would think you have to it, with the, with the drift event. Oh yeah. There's no way to get a good camera angle, but they added, they started getting some of the, uh, drone race guys around cause they're really good pilots and got some of that. And that's some of the best shots I've seen. And even there's a, uh, clutch kickers. It's a $10,000 event, every event. So it's a big money event already, which is nice to see in drifting, but you know, they've got really good, like grassroots level, uh, event with, uh, pro level coverage on, honestly almost better live coverage than formula drift has sometimes uh incorporated drone footage and it's so amazing to watch that's spot on but yeah i mean most local uh tracks or any kind of local authority has some ruling you can look up on drones and depending on what kind of drone you're using it's not hard sometimes you have to give permission sometimes it might need to be someone that's certified um but there's enough drones out there and right even, you right. Know, some of the a lot of it has to do with licensing yeah and it, it's not difficult so it's just about getting on top of that and you know track owners and event organizers there's tons of guys that'll come out and do that for cheap some sometimes free but um there's some guys that are very skilled that will do it for a reasonable cost yeah the um the like local I, track the, here there's a good i was gonna say there's a there's a couple there's one guy i see on youtube a lot doing things at events and it's it it's pretty awesome. He does a really, really good job, you know, and I, I don't know what he charges, but I'm sure he could charge more for whatever he's doing because it's, it's just that spot on watching it. You know, he's following, sometimes he's just above at the starting line. Sometimes he's following them down. Sometimes he's taking it all the way down the return road with guys. You know, when you get, get somebody that everybody's a fan of, he follows you around. He'll, you know, changes out batteries on a regular basis, gives you great camera shots on everything. Yeah. We've yeah. had drones land on top of moving cars. It's, yeah. And now yeah, you can that, even put, put controllers in the car so that like you can set the remote in the car and put it to follow mode. Uh, you can, you can make it to where you aim it and 
tell it that, hey, this is the color I want to follow of the car, and it'll follow it the entire time wherever you go, as, as best as it can keep up, obviously. There's a point where it can't fly as fast as your car yeah, might be going. But a, uh, Some drone footage from that event I was talking about, uh, partly because the, the blue car in the back is a car I built in tune. But, um, yeah, like, it just adds – this is a quick shot. It just adds a really awesome dynamic – the um, local track here, they won't let you put the drones past the starting line or over the track because we've had oh. similar issues with cars. They fall out of the sky. Yeah, so it's either off the side of the racetrack or not past the starting line. That's the rules. Right. Well, even even the 10 feet off to the side, if you're 30 feet up, it's still a great camera shot. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Let's see. Any other questions? Wow, Brian, that 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 drone footage of those drift cars is pretty rocking right there. I gotta say. Yeah, I'd have to go through. Like, if you almost look at any drift footage recently, FD or anything, clutch, this is from an event called Clutch Kickers down in Florida. Um, that's real awesome because it's grassroots, but you get a bunch of pro guys showing up, like a bunch of amateur guys showing up. But almost any drift footage now, uh, even the small grassroots events, we almost always have at least some sort of drone footage of. Um, not and you, always, you can tell whoever's. Whoever's flying that drone is like a racing drone guy, like because he's following oh, yeah. pretty good. Yeah, yeah, we've got. Uh, I would have to have some uh, FD stuff, but uh, like just a small example. It's just it's adds this this crazy dynamic because I, I think a lot of times in a lot of racing you don't get an idea what the speed is or or what it really feels like out on track, how close cars are, and um, I can't think of any form of racing that wouldn't be better with you know a drone with the cars. I'm looking hey, Perdudo, that on. background is uh, that background is not a, a proper VE for a nitrous car. You need a big weird hump in it for the nitrous. Yeah, you know, it's, it's the first one I found on Google. What do you want? You know, <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking. We got any questions out there? We need to get more questions. People ask questions. What do you want to know? Ask something we don't know the answer to, so we have to work for it. I monitor fuel temps and found running a Walbro 525 and a little four cylinder that fuel temps peaked after an hour of driving on 20 degrees Celsius day. Yeah, I, I believe that we're, I don't understand what, there's no question there. I apologize. Yeah, I think just in, there's so many factors in, in fuel temp. I've seen a bunch of questions about that. It's hard to say that this so, is a setup that works. I've seen twin 450 setups that never get hot. And then, you know, we had a twin 450 setup in a Supra with, you know, 10 minutes of idling and the fuel was 140 something degrees F. So <laughs> is it an uh, issue now yeah, where it's... our horsepower cap capability or horsepower capacity, whatever the word you want to look for is so much higher now that when you're talking something like a Supra that, you know, needs no fuel to idle, but can make 1400 horsepower. Um, yeah, that's exactly we've, we've what had, it is. Yeah. We've had the size pumps so large now that, we've outrun the idle side of the pump. And now that's for fuel pump controllers or capable EFI systems that can PWM or control frequency to a pump are becoming a necessity. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. PWM pumps, I think are going to be more and more popular. I think the biggest thing is uh, integration on those pumps right now is, is tricky on street vehicles sometimes. In this case, it was a super and, and drop in search tank. Even sometimes with the PWM pumps, there's only so much you can slow it down, right? There's there's a minimum speed that they go, even at the yeah. at, at the slowest then, they can the go. Pump is designed, and even sometimes like, that's too much. Right. And, and at a certain point, the pump is – you want it to be efficient where you need all the flow. So when you're slowing it down, you, the, the impellers don't work so well there. So you're putting heat into the fuel that way. So, yeah, it, it's really one of those uh, – there is no right answer. There's a lot of things you can do, um, but that's one. Measuring it is step one. And then knowing your physics and what you can and can't do and what your pros and cons are and how to cool it, whether it's, you know, are we yep, going to see more fuel cooling systems? You can, uh, you can often take care of some of that heat problem by going to a brushless pump because the brushes add a lot of heat into the fuel. Uh, It'll help some. Uh, sometimes just going to multiple smaller pumps helps because that small pump doesn't put as much heat into it as the big pump does. Sometimes they put more heat into it, and you gotta gotta play with it. Gotta try different things sometimes. Um, a lot of guys pump, get away with a, a pump, one big pump. Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of ways to try, but you have to. 
And sometimes it's the simplest thing is just to add a cooler to it, you know, put a transmission cooler on the return line. There's no real pressure on the return line and you can flow quite a bit of fluid through a, through a six or eight AN return line and a cooler that has a six AN, six AN and even just direct radiating, not necessarily even a fan on it will do better than having nothing at all sometimes. No oh, man, here we go. I can see all the intercooler manufacturers now. They're shoving fuel coolers into the intercooler tanks. Here it comes. Just like they'll have the tranny cooler and the fuel cooler stacked in the intercooler tank. John, get ready. They're already starting. I mean, already people been, are throwing you know, already been there, already trans coolers in with their – people are already sticking trans coolers in with the uh, air-to-water cooler for the, for yep. the air. So why Let's not see, we, throw another we, one in there? I mean – Dude, I mean, we've already stuck trans coolers in water tanks. Uh, then when the car went methanol, we took the water tank out of the front, out of the back, put it in front, run the fuel through the lines, and then shoved ice water in it, and then put the fuel through it. So, because guess what happens when methanol is like 34 degrees instead of 80 degrees when it sprays out of the fuel injectors? Mm, so, I can see it. Yep. <clears throat> The, the other thing that can help is, is keeping the bends and curves in your lines to a minimum. The, the longer, straighter paths that you can do, the less the fuel pump has to work because every bend you put adds a restriction to the line. And so it makes your fuel pump have to work harder, which means that you're going to add heat because that fuel pump has to work harder. So yeah, even I, just something as simple as physics. straighter, less, yeah. I think Optimize I it as much as you can. On a drag that car, maybe bring the fuel even. cell in the front of the car? Yeah, totally. Sorry, Brian, I cut you off. No, I'm saying Mechanical that's pumps do a good job at negating heat because you don't have things that are putting heat into it. The pump, you know, it's it also doesn't work literally hard spinning RPM. things that. Right. The downside to the mechanical pump is it has to be plumbed correctly, or you'll have a hell of a time getting the car to start and light off. You know, if you plumb it correctly, it'll pop off just like an EFI pump if you do it right. So what does doing it right entail? It's Jeff Stacy listening so to the So keeping Stacey fuel episode. gravity. Yeah. <laughs> keeping it. the fuel gravity fed into the pump. If, if you can do a cable drive pump and put it close to the tank and it has to pull less, then uh, you're, you're better there. If your tank is up front, then you're nice and close to it already, which helps. Just making it so it – Pushes instead of pulls in general will help get things going quicker. So you don't need a primer pump. Um, sizing it correctly so that you get the right amount through it. You know, if you put a, if you put too small of a pump, it has to work harder than if you put a bigger pump, if you put too big of a pump, it, it's a whole separate problem. Um, just sizing it correctly makes a big difference. Jay, to answer your question, I think there is a lot of heat generated when you're deadheading a fuel pump capable of 1,300, 1,400, 1,500 horse through a tiny orifice in the regulator. I do think there is heat there, but I don't have the data to back that up. Well, if you're deadheading, you're going to be working the pump harder. Well, anytime you're forcing a fluid through an orifice or anything through an orifice, it's going to be heated. You're in orifice. orifice. Dars Laws speaks from experience and says, belt for the win. Good to see you, Dars. <laughs> what else any other questions don't make us shut this thing down early we ain't shutting down <laughs> we, shut we got down. to hang out with dars at uh, <laughs> breakfast at one of the hotels at rmrw what a what a great guy to meet is it the first person. time you've met him dude i've known him for a long time yes. he is super cool yeah. no he's a nice dude good dude dude his car is also a bmf just saying throwing it out there Oh, yes, hero. Car. He's got three or four. He's got two or three. Yeah, does he? I like his Oldsmobile. Yeah. The Oldsmobile's always been badass, and then he's got one that's got a turbo small block Chevrolet in it. I don't know which one's got that motor in it. But he's they were got there with a the long roof at RMRW. Old yeah, Mobile. he had the wagon. Sweet. Well, there's a legit question. I have a six liters LS twin 7175 precision turbos, not intercooled on a 3,800 pound Silverado air motive eliminator pump on C16. Yeah. Switch to methanol. If you ain't got an intercooler, man, 
Uh, blah, blah, blah. Using a cam-driven mechanical pump I have already. Or trying the Aeromotive Brushless 10.0. Anyone have any methanol experience with the new 10.0? Was Capizzi running that? I, I'm going to... I know I'm going to say there's not that. enough data on it. Yeah, not enough data. Yeah, I, not yet. That's our cheapo answer. Um, I, I, there's a couple of guys running it that are friends that's, of mine. That's my lawyer safe yeah. answer. Right. <laughs> a couple of people running E85 with the 5.0, but I don't know anybody running methanol with 10.0. John, what got you fired up last night about methanol and ethanol? What, what got you going? I don't remember. I just saw your post this morning about the methanol versus the ethanol. Oh, it just I I just post random shit trying to start the fucking pot sometimes just to see who bites. <laughs> you just, really? Just to, there's just a, I mean, I you, you just do random shit every once in a while just to see it. And I just fucking throw the fucking chemical formulas of methanol and ethanol up there, see if anybody fucked a bit took it. You know. It's fun. It's fun doing that shit every once in a while. M1 air fuel targets, yep. Justin Brown. Yep. Haven't we? Didn't we discuss that last four fucking months ago? We've talked about that before. I know, Justin. On your better. car, your idle targets are like six and a half to one, six to six and a half to one at idle. You're going to be like four one to four three up to like twenty pounds. Then after twenty pounds, you're going to start richening it up. And then about 40 pounds, you're going to try and target about 3.8. And that'll get you started. Is, is he a dry block? No. So my experience, and this is just my experience, not necessarily a rule, has been that the, the wet blocks typically like it just a little bit leaner. And the dry blocks, you have to richen it up for cooling. So for me, it ends up being till about almost 30 pounds of boost around 4041. And then... Once you get beyond that, you have to start pushing the fuel to it to cool it down some. Idle, in general, for me, on methanol cars, doesn't want to be 6.5. doesn't want to be stoic. It wants to be richer. So it, it wants to be more like 5.5 at idle. Yeah. And then they tend to be a little happier. That's typically where I run well, is 5.5. Again, I, well, not the here's, rule. Here's, it's just – well, I'm going to stop you right there because I did the cam that's in the motor, and I've done and worked on – at least half a dozen other cars, and I can tell you right now, to keep the oil clean and everything situated, the cars are perfectly happy idling six three six five, and they don't. And that's why I said it's not the rule; it's just been my experience. Them. Yeah, and yeah, the I, overlap that I put I, in his cams with the turbocharger that he's got, the cylinder heads, and the intake manifold that he has, he's he's going to be want to be into the sixes on his idle. Because with his car, to keep it from wanting to milk the oil and make a fucking mess. Well, with methanol, yeah. you're pretty much changing the oil every time you go to the track anyways. You don't have to, but if if you're milking it that bad, you've got issues. Says uh, EGT on X85 fuel. How much difference in temp between cylinders do I look for? And what would you less. consider... Yeah, what would you consider high for a temp? I wouldn't consider any temp high, but 150 or less. No. The, the temperature is based on how deep you put the probe into the stream, but the temperature-wise, I, I like to see them less than 150 degrees apart. Perdido, that's a great background. I don't know, S about F. <laughs> I'm being politically correct. Carry on. <laughs> Okay. So, so Jesse Scott, Coburn, has Scott, any has, are, are, has no, sorry, go ahead, Scott. So has anyone had issues with the 361 crank sugar? I keep losing RPM signal. So we need to figure out why you're losing RPM signal because they're fairly stable and we've had them on cars spinning 12,000 RPM with no issues. Where we run into problems is typically noise caused by the ignition system or sometimes the sensor gap itself or the uh, voltage going into it isn't very stable. There, there's lots of things that can cause the problem. And we got to figure right. out where the problem is stemming from first. Sometimes as simple as it's moving forward, like Perduto just said, the thrust bearing is, is gone, or you're pushing it so far in movement that it's no longer in line with the wheel. Or there's flex in the wheel, you know? Sometimes it's as simple as when you start spinning it, 
and you got a flimsy wheel, it bends a little bit and it gets out of line with the, with the trigger. Troy Baum says the fuel, fuel temp with a pump gas cable drive system averages between 10 and 40 degrees above ambient. And he says he figures with an electric would create more heat. I would have to give you that. I think electric would create more heat. Yep. Did I hear the words pump gas and cable drive in the same sentence? That's interesting. You did from Mr. Troy Baum. Huh. Yeah, he's got a he's got a cable drive on his car. I think he's set up to run an E85. That's is he a cool. pump gas hero? He, that car is a kind of a pump gas hero. It fucking runs like 940s on it's eight a pounds or nine pounds, something stupid. With space you need to hurry. on his plugs. You need to hurry up. I can't <laughs> wait for that to be done. It's a pump gas hero, but drop. he That's saved 20 drop. bucks. Sorry, carry on. It's going to be epic. Um, <laughs> yeah, really inspired the something video, really cool. I'm just going to The video it idea is going to be epic. The video oh, is yeah. going to be epic. Your Muley's spawned a hilarious idea that we're bringing to fruition. Carry on. Neat. Listen, I've got the, listen yeah. I've got the mullet wig and the red. I've got the, the mullet with the red bandana wig already ready to go. It's all situated. Uh huh. He's a punk gas hero with specs on his plugs. Best He's a punk gas hero. Jesus Christ. But he saved 20 bucks. Sorry. Best fuel to use in a standalone nitrous cell when spraying on a Gen 5 LT4, making 800 plus on E85. He's jetted for a 200 shot on top of the 800 plus on the blower setup. Currently has C16 in the cell E85 in the tank. I'm going to tell you to take the C16 out and put C23 in it. VP import? <laughs> yeah, import. See, I'd go C23 just because. Yeah. Give yourself yeah, yeah, for nitrous. On his blood. If I mean, that's, in not, that cell, that's, <laughs> that's not a fucking tuning nightmare or anything. I mean, we've got a Gen 5 LT1 direct injected motor that's drinking ethanol. It's blown, making 800 horsepower. They're going to put nitrous on top of it and put gas in on the direct on the direct port standalone fuel system. Well, yeah, both that's, we go wrong. That's, that's not a fucking tuning nightmare. No. Or anything. Hey, he could be like the Viper guys back in the day and add propane in the mixture just to make our lives a real pain in the ass, okay? Right? I mean, fuck, <laughs> what's one more thing to worry about? Put some fucking CNG in it. To answer your question, I would I would put C23 in it. If you're going to use such a small quantity and you're going to use maybe a pint or two going down track on that setup, put the best, the highest octane, the most you can get in it. You're not, it's not an expense thing at that point. Run the good fuel. We got to get rid of that. Smudge Is E85 pump gas? <laughs> yeah, yes, I got to get, I got to get another camera. I, I scratched the lens on this one. It comes in a pump. You can probably just get a new lens for it. Or hit it with toothpaste. Oh, toothpaste might work. Yeah. I mean, everything. I, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, anything you can burn in a fucking race car is pump gas. Because every fuel you can get at some point Comes in time pump. come out of a fucking pump. Dude, where I moved, this is great. <laughs> I Bewley, pumped it right out of the barrel. So, Bewley, not I far from where shit. you're going to be. No, you can get, mm -hmm. uh, There's a, there's a, they have VP <laughs> Racing gas stations Hush. down here. And you can get... Yeah. Uh, up to 110 in the pump, and did they got pails in the store of C16? Yeah, I know. It's awesome. I mean, yeah, I, know, a, I know. We have a store oh, here that's like awesome. A, I mean, I know of a couple of I stores. I need that out that, here. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of stores who have, have literally created pump stations for C16. Yep. You know, they get their barrel in, and they put a they put a siphon tube in their barrel, and they've got a dispenser with the, the handle just, a, you know, right there, like, at the counter and shit to – to pump your Honestly, C16. we're debating doing that in the shop here because E85 is so expensive and we have so many guys wanting us to tune on it that we can order a pallet of E98 and mix it down for cheaper than the three, I think it was what, what it was the last picture I sent you guys, 340 a gallon or 329 a gallon that I was paying for E85. Jeez, stupid. What yeah, I got to go get some more tomorrow. Yeah. What the hell? I mean, dude, there's no reason why you couldn't do E. I don't see understand why you couldn't do E85 in bulk. Like, are are do none of the like uh, local petroleum companies do any kind of local fuel delivery? 
I don't understand why you couldn't go I don't get know a 285 and... trucks. We, yeah, that, that's one thing we haven't gone down the route of because I don't know what it takes to get that delivery into a big tank like that. Um, but I, well, I, mean, I guess it's worth a shot. In the state of Kentucky, you don't have to worry anything about um, like storage tank rules or anything like that up to 150 gallons. Because yeah, so uh, we Elizabeth ran, Warren we ran is a into, senator in the state I live in. <laughs> yeah, I understand that, and I know what state you live in, and I get yeah. all that shit. But like, you know, uh, when I was a kid, we were able to have a hundred and fifty gallon diesel tank on site, freestanding, yeah. no containment, yep. uh, no containment in tank yeah. or anything, you know. And you know, we just called the Hildreth Hopper Oil Company when the tank got low and their bulk truck came out, filled the tank up for us and sent us a bill, you know, so Barnhill, you know. a couple of years ago, they invented this thing and I can't remember what it's called. You should get one though. It's um, a moving truck. You get one of the things, <laughs> he ended somewhere else. No, they have a thing for I'll you. It's called Samsonite. Like, oh. Right. <laughs> My wife is already like, when are we moving somewhere that's not cold and not here? As Keith Turk uh, said, I think Samsonite. the answer to that is when the kid that is like six weeks away at this point is old enough that her parents won't kill us when we move again. That'll be never. Bring them with you, yeah. man. Get a place with a with a honey with a uh, mother in law suite. Move soon. Yeah, we yeah, can get your uh, place out here with a mother-in-law suite. It'll only cost two million six. <laughs> oh, dude, yeah, my my uh, brother is looking for housing in uh, Bay Area right now, and it's ridiculous. You can, you can knock like three zeros off that number and live in Vegas. I mean, it's it's been talked about because I do have a program out there. So I don't know if I uh, I, I don't know if I ever get quite to Vegas. I think I could get her to Arizona at least. Get her to visit. I'll introduce her to the best food around. She'll love it here. <laughs> Kudos, Keith Turk, sending me some great texts right now, man. What's he got here? He's got a bottle of small batch specialty apple jack. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting mix there on the counter at Keith's place. There. Right. And yeah. What else he got? Yeah, Angry got Orchard Hard texture. Cider Rosé. Fancy. Yeah, I know. There's some. There's some. Uh, and fucked up day. I feel well, you. You know, he's a land speed guy. That angry orchard rosé <laughs> is really sweet. Yeah. Too sugary. Yeah, I don't know where Kevin Shaw lives, but they're paying five dollars a gallon for ninety one. I'd get another one of their moving truck things and find somewhere else to be. That would I be think a he's going to need a yeah, yeah, to point. Australia. Ooh, that'd be why. Because I'm pretty sure he lives down under. Kevin Shaw's in New so Zealand. Hit, He's a good buddy of ours. Yep. We hit stations in uh, Kansas where E85 was more expensive than 87. That was novel in my experience. I mean, it's it's more expensive than premium here. Well, the uh uh what is it? The subsidies went away from it. What used to be dirt cheap used to be hundred buck forty a gallon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah well, we hold you like personally $1, responsible $1, for Elizabeth Ohio. Warren. So yeah, you've well. got to do something about that, dude. Hey, go easy on her. I, She's I a uh, Native American. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah so yeah. she gets oh one one thousand yeah, one sixteenth fourth of the reparations. Yeah, good for her. Josh is Minson, it me or what's up, Joshua? got that thing that that hides your face so you can't be recognized on video. No, he's got a he's got a scratch on his lens. He needs to sit to the right. You just need to sit on the other side of the lens. I know, right? That's super annoying. I'm like, I just want to come over there and wipe that thing off. It's like a booger on the face of somebody you're talking to, and they don't know what's there. It's hilarious. How's that? Is that better? No. (laughs) Move about a foot (laughs) to the right. Bewley's not sure. (laughs) Is it me or does Bewley look like an extra pissed off Danny Trejo and Machete? Part six. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, that's hilarious. He's got his dip going. Don't make him spit it out. <laughs> yeah, I'm down to like two a day. I'm trying to quit. So doing good, man. You least doing real <laughs> yeah, good. There, on there, there's, may or may there's not only be. so many. There's only so many invites vices in life a man can try and quit at one time right right there's only so much bad shit you can try and get out of your life at one shot I'm, <laughs> i've got the food under control now i'm working on the nicotine 
after that's under control, I'll work on the fucking alcohol. Is there nicotine in the, uh, there's nicotine in dip? I'm stupid. I guess I didn't even realize that. Of course there is. Well, Sorry. Yeah. Dur- yeah, yeah. Scott Clark Dur- is dumb. Dur- Go big red truck there, Clark. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, John, get your, get yourself a patch. <laughs> And uh, I, I think you'll find that there's an inverse correlation of the amount of dip versus the amount of uh, times you get to dip it, if you understand my meaning. Right. We have an <laughs> issue, guys. We screwed up. We're like over an hour into this show, and we haven't pissed anyone off yet. Oh, I'm sure we have. I mean, we can probably remedy that real quick. Big shout out. Joshua Minson's on here tonight, and he's right, man. We could move to Utah. But we'd all have to become Mormons or something, wouldn't it be, or something like that? Yeah, they I mean, don't sell beer on certain days or something yeah, like I that. I couldn't. Bro, that. No, I went out there. I bought a bottle of Jack Daniels in Utah, put it in the freezer, and it froze. <laughs> yeah, like they, the alcohol the bit can't be over that's a certain percentage. Wrong. Like you can't get IPAs. I love IPAs. Nah, that's just not gonna work. And yes, Gregory, that was Harambe behind my head earlier. I'll bring him back later. So I did actually just look up real quick. Uh, I believe you're allowed to haul up to 120 gallons of fuel without placards or uh, DOT tags. 999 so I, pounds. Okay. Uh, it goes by weight. Everything goes by weight. So I need to figure out materials. how much that is because I'm driving to Ohio next week. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to fill up uh, eight pounds per gallon. Rule of thumb. So apparently oh, someone just posted weight. that you, you can get away with a lot right now. Too. If you're bringing ethanol home and you're using it for hand sanitizer, just saying. Ew. Oh, yeah, man. I, think I didn't even think of that angle. That, that was if our extensive for the <sighs> distillery operation going on over here, my buddy Jason. Oh, man. Uh, we're making so hand sanitizer. Joe Sorbello. First time this week. Lit. And, uh, man, Joe Sorbello, I'm jealous as oh, hell. Oh, right yeah. If, you, if you're sitting there drinking on Elijah Craig 18 years, oh. I am one jealous motherfucker right now. Yep. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I, I might be a little even I might even be a little bit mad because you got some and I don't. It's been oh. like it's been like 14, 15 months since I've been able to get my hand on a bottle of 18 year. Didn't we finish a bottle of 18 year down here? We need to get him one, man. Yeah, we help. Fi- yeah, it's been no, I didn't have 18 year at your house. We've been we had 23 year at your house. You're right. You're right. Yep. I haven't had 18 years since last Christmas. A year ago last Christmas. I haven't had any for a while. I can't get my hands on it. Come out and visit, John. I just got a bottle. I'm jealous. If any of you guys listening, go to the liquor store, visit the liquor store, and your liquor store has a bottle of Elijah Craig 18 year on it. And you have the liquidity to purchase that bottle. Buy it. I will pay you for it. I will cover your cost to package and put that in the mail to me. No questions asked. I will cover your cost, your expenses, and I will pay for your time in taking care of me to get Elijah Craig 18 year. That is that is my absolute favorite bourbon to this day. It's still better than the 23 year. This There's is good information to have. Yep. Jerry, and I might still fight almost, you over St. Louis having the real barbecue. You know, we, Florida might not be known for it, but we throw down down here. I'm just saying. Questions are falling, guys. You guys are slacking. We still got 60 people listening, 70 some people. Yeah, but I know. I mean, normally we say Q and A, and we get like we got questions before people are even. Uh, yeah, but we had the technical issue. I think half of them probably gave up. I don't know. Well, we lost oh, like yeah. the 40 or 50 some on YouTube, but we still got our 50 or 60 here, which is crazy good for live listeners, man. I'm I'm surprised y'all listen to us. What's interesting, though, is the podcast. If I don't get the podcast put up the next morning, I got people all over the world bitching at me about not having those up. We have 1,500 different people will just listen to the podcast audio by the time we get up in the morning. Still pretty crazy. Should we revisit this question that Jake Hildebrandt posts about um, how do I make a two post battery disconnect kill the motor when cycled? I told him and how to do you that. did post a res- you posted a response to that, but is this an appropriate time for us to revisit the issue around solid state battery disconnects and all that stuff? I mean, don't run one or I guess some people say you can. I've just never had good luck with them. The, the problem I've yeah, had with 
PW. Yeah, I'm the opposite. I love solid state battery disconnects. I've had uh, zero issues. With I mean, them, I bet you do, but you know what's what happens? Different have, application. Have you ever had one that where the alternator starts fucking up and flaking out, or you lose one of the diodes and the of the three diodes in the alternator, and everything starts flickering? It literally starts going PWM mode, and it it I, I just my problem is the so cars that we have. We run the Cartex, which are ground side disconnect. Oh, that's probably better because yeah. they're legal in rotor. That's like the go to in road race and drifting. Yeah. So Illegal I've never had, had an alternator go out. But yeah, those are not so, legal in NHRA. Yeah, you're right. Got it. Yeah. Well, who knows? This may be the time to one? influence NHRA a little more. Um, I know Keith Turk is on here. Uh, I'm just going to throw this out loud. Keith, are negative side or positive side, or do you, does ECTA or SCTA care about battery connects? and whether they're solid state or not. I'd just be curious because if you get land speed and drift and road racing all on the negative side, I so think speak, they want uh, a physical maybe that disconnect. Can be influenced. One of them will say we have to do it different just to be a pain in the ass. Right, and like they're, if you can't pass power, I don't care what side it is. The, uh, the, the, the negative disconnects are FIA approved. I, I get it. But yeah, that like, should be good enough. <laughs> But I think I think NHRA's thing was well. I'm I'm not even gonna go there. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't know if I told you guys. It was about the time we no. It was after we started this podcast. It was 2015, and I, I got an audience with some of the NHRA tech officials, the California guys, trying to explain why they should let people run whatever ECU they wanted in pro stock, and some sales guy from Holly convinced them that. You got to run our special box and our, which was an HP that painted a different color. And you got to run our special firmware, which just had a locked rev limiter you couldn't touch. Otherwise, someone's going to hide traction control from you. And, and I was like, well, I can use their firmware with their advanced tables and make some traction power based power management stuff. What? I don't And, and they're like, nope, got to run the Holly. You know, just he didn't get it. So I'm I'm not this I'm not even trying to convince the NHRA guys that you can cut the ground side, even though the Formula One guys are okay with it, right? Whatever. But anyway. Hope they pull out of this COVID thing. Uh, yeah, I mean racing in general. <laughs> uh sure. I just saw a question and now I can't find it. Now Keith just says it's gotta shut the junk off. That's his test. That's what the test should be. Yep, very good. Yeah, so as long as you wired it right, that's and good. guys, people are asking if LS Fest East is still on. The correct answer is, as of right now, they haven't canceled it. Is it still on? No one knows, man. John uh, Ryan's no telling way. me a solid yes, man. John Ryan's, uh, he, well, I don't know what it is. That's his real name. Pro Stock John, you remember him from the LS Tech days? Yep. He's helping yep, yep. out with the rules, and he's saying, man, it's he was an adamant that it was still on and that they were pushing for it to be still on. Um, we'll find out what happens, but... All I got to say is good luck because Andy Bashir, the governor in our state, is a blooming fucking idiot, and there's no telling what they might run up against trying to get it to go, trying to get it to go off. So thanks for listening to Foolproof no Radio, what's folks. What's going to happen there? Yeah. <laughs> yep. This is Foolproof Radio, foolproofperformance.com. Uh, check us out. <laughs> We're based out of Kentucky. <laughs> that's, that's not even the right fucking website, dumbass. <laughs> well, that net, sorry. FPP. Yeah, I got it. Sorry. I fucked that up. I'm sorry. Uh, so I think uh, I forgot had a question here. Some other question. Uh, advantage to running a larger high pins injectors versus low. Um, what if I told you? to turn your ECU on the high impedance injector when you're running low or vice versa. Never mind. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's, so we talked a little bit about this, about like the, the air faulting and Holly and, you know, putting it on that mode. So it doesn't fault, but uh, to be honest, it, this it has to do a lot with the driver is itself. It much of a benefit to low impedance. Yes. The, the low impedance injector in general, most of them uh, can open faster at low pulse widths um, right. they, and than a high impedance injector is. And that's just basic coil load at that point. Um, the, 
the problem becomes that you have to have an injector driver that's physically capable of providing enough amperage because as you lower the impedance, the amperage of what that injector neat draws will go up. So if you have a, what they call a peak and hold style injector driver, um, there's different ratios that happen. Most peak and hold high impedance injector drivers are a four to one ratio. So it's four peak amps to make it open and then one for it to hold. And a low impedance injector generally needs more than that. So they make eight two injector drivers, which gives you eight amps for the old, which is a lot. Um, and then they even make ones that do tend to as well. Um, basically the lower yes. impedance injector, the bigger driver, you, the, the better driver you need for it more or less. Um, the benefit being that a lot of those large, large injectors that can open fast, well, the disadvantage is that they are low impedance at that point. So you do need the injector driver, but the low impedance ones in general, and it's not always the case because not all low impedance injectors are faster than high impedance injectors. But me, most of the time you'll find that low impedance injectors have a shorter uh, off timer or time that they can be turned off between pulses. Yeah. I wish, uh, I wish uh, Tom was on tonight. Cause that's the, the whole thing. I, I've never, I haven't looked at the data on it recently. I've run, you know, 2000, 2200 CC high impedance injectors. Um, and back in the day, say, you know, five, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, especially you couldn't run anything that big and get any yeah. idle with a damn. Um, I will say high impedance injectors have come a very long way and there's a lot of nice things that they take less power. So they make less heat. They're easier to run. Um, you know, I've got that, that blue drift car that was actually in that video idles 14.2, 14.1 with 2200 CC injectors on ignite red. Um, I've done it yep. with 2000 what, CC injectors on pump gas. And what it comes down to is what is your minimum idle pulse width needed at idle yep. to control idle stably, right? If you find that you need one and a half milliseconds, you're probably fine with high impedance injectors. Most of the time you're still within range of most of the market. At that point, um, if you need if you if you need bigger injectors because at the top end you're making enough power that you need the flow, potentially look at why you need those injectors. Where are you running your fuel pressure at? What are you doing? Like there's ways around it. In general, we try to run a lower fuel pressure because it's easier on the pumps. The the pump goes a longer way. But at some point, you have to look at the fact that maybe your injectors become so big and so drastic because of that that you have to consider some swap offs of how you might run those to get, to get what you really need. Yeah. It, it's really about knowing what your minimum low pulse width is, which is a number that most injector, good injector manufacturers will give you. Um, so if you know that number, you know, Tom will give you those, those with his injectors. Um, most of the other good injectors will. And that, that's exactly what it comes down to. And I, Lee Connor asked about uh, potential control at low pulse width. <laughs> And it really yeah. comes down to that. If you can open at the and pulse width and your minimum pulse width is that low, you'll be fine. The other thing you run into is low pulse width linearity and many ECUs have a linearization table available in them. And what that means is that while normally it looks like a pretty straight line going up the scale across all, all your injector values, down at the very, very bottom, it's not very linear. It's, it's very jagged. And so you get these little dips and bumps in it and, a table to fix that. Low impedance injectors, in my experience, have, have had less deviation at the low side of them than high impedance injectors do. do. Again, not yeah, always the case, and technology there. is catching up. So it's it's coming, it's getting better and better as technology improves. But that's one of the things that you have to look at as well. Some some people say, oh, I can't get my idle idle to be consistent. It might be just because it's very non-linear at the bottom of your injector, not necessarily because you have some other problem. YouTube lit off on questions, guys, just so you know. Um, good timing to start with a 4.8 with a small cam on a 150 to 200 shot pump gas or a C85. Um, you're not, you're, you're not going to pull a lot of timing on the 85 unless you're pushing the envelope NA. But the old two degrees per 50 horsepower still does work very well. It will be overly conservative, but you'll end up pulling more than you need. And you can walk it back in by reading the spark plugs. Sorry. Um, oh, reading the spark <laughs> plugs. Oh, no. <laughs> Super good. Um, <laughs> uh, just allow traction control. Some guy said he loves his 2D traction control table. 
Uh, Holly Systems, what is the safest way to battery cut the car and not hurt the computer but kill everything? All the pro stock guys kit the, I, hit I the, do the switch, the mechanical switch, and it survives just fine. Yep, I do the mechanical switch in the back of my car. I Before I switched to the Mtron, I had a Holly since version one, since beta versions of Holly. Yep. And I killed it with the battery cut off at the back, disrupting the hot power to the to the Holly directly and uh, never once had an issue. I don't understand where the problem comes that people are losing their tunes from killing the power. I don't know what causes that, but I never once had a single issue with that on my car. I honestly think if you're, if you're having those problems, it points to a bigger wiring problem somewhere, and you're having some other spike or some other noise that's being exacerbated when you grab that kill switch and either dump a bunch of alternator load or something along those lines. Um, if you're not any that's something else. car tech makes a nice little their their battery cutoffs have a separate output specifically to to control the ignition switch on the ecu so if you need some keep alive awesome. it can keep that on but kill everything else oh, that's shit, why i'm that's a big killer. fan of the car tech. it just the, sucks how much are those what's the retail allowed. on the car tech what do you so sell the, the car tech the for? car tech so the xr is the one i'm talking about with the um uh the kill the battery kill um, and that one I want to say is a 359. The more basic version that doesn't have the uh, the ECU kill, which is still fine. It's what we run on the drift car. Uh, that one is 299. He obviously doesn't work with drag racers much. <laughs> yeah. Hey Brian, is that one set yeah. up so that you can have a kill switch in the cabin as well as yeah, an external yeah. kill so switch for a, safety? Man, I, I need to see if I have some pictures here. So the way they come, they come with two buttons that are uh, uh, the the kill switch is FIA approved, so it's not used to what you guys are used to seeing. It's a it's a big blue button that goes outside the car, and a little blue button that goes inside the car. Yeah, okay. Um. So yeah, and uh, there's another one by ECU Masters that's a, a a power side kill, which if you're running an ECU Master P PDM or something like that, integrates really nicely over CAN. That's the big advantage there. Um, that one you have to wire your own button in, but any button would work. Um, or you could run, you could uh, gang it off one of your can buttons and switches. I know NHRA won't go for that. It's a shame they won't, though. They should look into it. Yeah, just, my problem yeah, I mean, is, is some of the cheaper color, ones. They make a red button. <laughs> guys were selling some of the cheaper ones, and they were did not turn out so good. I'd seen them, some of them go up in flames. You know, I know some guys that stopped selling those here online <laughs> the last couple of years because they were I, doing weird stuff. Barnhill. I think part of yeah, part uh, of that reason that NHRA. Math uh, uh, part of that reason math. Math. Here math. We it's go. inferring math. It's not real math. <laughs> what are we talking All about right, now? So, <laughs> on uh, YouTube, the question was asked. I'll, 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 I'll stage this one for Barnhill. I'm going to drink um, a little bit while you're talking. so I can We know you're passionate it. about the math for VE, but why do you all prefer to tune in VE over pounds per hour? Why is it better? Barnhill required with because, replied with because math. The response was, isn't pounds per hour still a form of math? Asking for real, not poking. Corey, he's not, this is not aimed at you, but I know where Barnhill's going to go. Just understand. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, pounds per hour is not math. You're just telling the ECU to inject a certain amount of fuel. It does whatever you tell it and doesn't measure anything else, which is great if you did all the math on your end. But so that takes a lot of time and I'm lazy as shit. So <laughs> no. uh, in VE mode, all of your, your data, your, your map sensor, your intake temp sensor, your PV equals NRT, your ideal gas law is calculated. All you do is plug your VE number in and what air fuel ratio you want and the computer calculates everything else. So that way, if all of your settings are right, you've got your injector settings right, you've got all of your setup right, your, your, your stuff calibrated right, you're just tuning VE. So your model is now correct, which means that little changes, fuel pressure, whatever, are going to be calculated by the ECU and compensated for rather than, oh man, my, my tune's so different tonight, I'm chasing this all the time. There's going to be less chasing your tune and changing it every time some small condition changes because your fuel model is correct and being calculated rather than being baked in by inferred calculations that you you didn't really do. But when you tuned it, that's what you did. You tuned for those calculations, but the computer doesn't know that. So when some condition changes, the computer doesn't know. It's going to inject the exact same amount of fuel. 
don't know if you can see what I'm sharing. So it's so, kind of like the difference between electronically replicating mechanical injection or actually taking advantage of what you can actually do with electronic fuel injection. Is that a way well, to say that? In the Holly world, yeah. I'll, I'll just say this. In Holly world... The, the Holly math isn't 100% right either. No, no, but, but let me just point this out. A practical example, nothing to do with the math. In the Holly world, every single one of them, when you switch the pounds per hour table to VE table to see what's going on, they have like 800% jacked up. 800 more fuel at idle than the engine needs. And you think, oh, but my map is flat. No, it's not. You're, you're literally, the engine dips 20 RPM and you're putting four times as much fuel yeah. and you don't even know better. And that's why your car runs like dog shit off of idle. And, and, and it's so funny because no one you point that out to, they're going to be like, so? I don't know. You know, to get back to my YouTube channel and my tattoos. But anyway, it's just... <laughs> Do it VE mode. So do it in VE mode. Do it right. Corey, no. Yeah. If, if your VE table is not over 100, your math's not wrong. It's just you're beyond what 100% of your NA engine would be capable of producing. And that's the Hollywood. Uh, no, if you're if if your VE is over 100%, it means your math model is not 100% accurate. Yeah. Physically, it is right. not possible to do more than 100%, yeah. regardless of how much air you force into a motor, because you're not increasing the air when it goes in, you're increasing the density. Remember that Jupiter conversation we had a while back, yeah. right? The CFM is still the same. If a motor flows 400 CFM per hole, it's still going to flow 400 yeah, CFM yeah, per yeah. hole at 25 pounds of boost. It's just 25 pounds of density crammed into that yeah. 400 CFM. The way I've always started a VE, expo VE explanation is your engine is an air pump. Forget everything else. Forget fuel. Forget all this other bullshit. Your engine's job is to pump air. So the first thing we want to do is make sure we know how well it's pumping air. And that's what VE is. Everything else is just math based on air. So if we know how well our engine is an air pump, tell it that and let everything else work. And yeah, there, there's, uh, you know, even so Lynx uh, fuel model isn't 100% right either. Um, and there's, there's cases where, you know, you get VE numbers that are over 100 because the math isn't 100% right. Um, and I forget, uh, Clark, uh, you mentioned once why Holly, do they not compensate for RPM or something like that in their model? I forget exactly what it was. My assistant I mean, I telling me you with, do a better job explaining I disagree with the fact. I I, Sorry. I honestly disagree with the fact that it's impossible to be, to genuinely be correct and be over 100%. You say that's not possible. I disagree with that. No, 100% by volume. Physics Listen, is not stop, possible. Hold it. Stop, stop. You will never be more than 100% by true volume, which is space in the cylinder. That's a fixed number of cubic inches, okay? You'll be more than 100% oh, by density. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. So nope, you're, that's, that's what volumetric but, efficiency is, but, guys. But here's, yeah. here's the thing. Here's the, here's the thing, is if the mass air meter is measuring air at standard temperature pressure, and the cylinder fill is filling greater than 100%, it's greater than 100% atmospheric density pressure. in the cylinder. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, the VE table is measuring air at standard temperature pressure, correct? Yeah. No. Isn't, isn't, no. That a constant, no. isn't that a constant? Isn't that a constant VE table? Otherwise, when you have, if you're just versing standard temperature and pressure, it, it's standard temp. It, if you're just doing it versus atmospheric, then a boosted car would have what 200% VE. Yep. And if you do the math out for PV equals an RT, that's not the case. Um, yeah, ideal gas loss otherwise. Is, yep. Yeah, so it, it's how well the engine is consuming available air because that's really what Correct. we care about. What the percentage fill of the available, available of the available space yep. is. But it's funny because Buley, you kind of said it yourself. A mass airflow sensor is measuring air mass, and you're right. You'll get over 100% of that standard temperature and pressure. Of right. mass, right? Because a very, very good naturally aspirated engine has the ability to draw more air in yeah. based on you know if you're if you're measuring the density of the air yep. with an so, IPT sensor yep. and all of that. He's right. No, listen, the ability if you talk to, to John Cosby, effect if you with, talk to John Cosby, yeah, he'll tell has, you. John Cosby will tell you a good engine master's motor was 114, 115 percent volumetric efficiency. But that's not—they're not actually right in the in the terminology. 
but they will say that, and they, they they work that way, and it's common in the industry. And so I'm with you on that. I'm, I'm with you. That's not it's not technically yeah, wrong to say that. It's bad, but it's, it's bad terminology, is what yeah, it is. Because it technically, is. you're not improving the. It's like saying fill a glass with water until it overflows. That's 100 percent sitting in the glass. Exactly. You can't cram more water into that glass unless you compress it in some way, shape, or well, form. Yep. Yeah. Well, we know right. 100 percent compressible fluid. Uh, all means all, and that's <laughs> all. All there. means. <laughs> Well, doesn't I mean, matter what the fl- and water is, but water listen, is listen, 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 just very minute. They're not talking about the volume of the fluid. They're talking about the volume that it has a possibility to fill. So they don't care what the density right. is. Correct. VE doesn't care about the density. But that's right. V is the, the density is part of the calculation that tells it how much fuel to spit out. So when you're at right, but the fact is two, two bar is, boost, it it's twice the fuel of one bar. But well, but it has I to, always care, it has to is, care about the density of fuel. In. It's the mass it's, in the it's manifold still a, versus the mass in the cylinder. Yes. And if you look at the way the yes. mass is, so the way I always explained it is, and it depends, this is the way I explained it to engineers when I taught tuning at college when they'd have us do seminars is if you have, say, 100 molecules per liter of air in your manifold, and I've got a one liter cylinder, and I only have 50 molecules of air in that cylinder, my cylinder is only 50% efficient. And if you do the math out and you take that, so now I know that my V is 50% or 80% or whatever. So the rest of my equation, so we, we know our, we know our, our air density or, you know, in our, in our equation, basically, I've got an intake temp sensor. I've got a map sensor. So I know what the density in that manifold was. Uh, I know all the RPMs. So that's the volume we're moving. So now I've got all parts of my equation. All I needed to know is how much air made it from that manifold to that cylinder, and that's a real simple calculation. Yeah, I mean, I don't doubt it. And it's still, you know, and it's yeah. volume efficiency, not mass efficiency. There's a big difference. Well, volume I, yeah, efficiency, I, I, I not mass that. efficiency. I get that, and and we know the volume is fixed. We know the pump volume, the pumping volume of the engine, the CFM, the cubic feet per minute that it's moving, is a fixed number because the displacement's fixed. But yeah, but but what to, it's to the moving point. is easily compressible, and it, it the density of it can be changed and affected very very easily. Right. And, the and the density doesn't change the VE number. The density doesn't change the VE number. The right. density changes the total amount of fuel coming out. Now just hang on a second. The though. volume that's, is still the same. In the quote unquote ideal model, that's true. But some systems like Megasquirt and Holly will go over that number. We'll just leave it at that. Right. Most systems yeah, don't so do it 100 percent correct. There's there's some systems that don't take man up map and IAT into cur- into account, right? And that's that's where it works. And if you understand why, that's fine. Just accept the model, move on. Know why your numbers mean what right. they mean. That's really my thing. As long as you know what you're doing. But if you think about it from a purely control standpoint, you know, Jordan Walsh asked if any of you guys are engineers. Yes, I am. My master's was in thermal fluids. <sighs> And part of my undergrad was in controls. Take so, that, motherfucker! Real tuners has an engineer. Put, got it. Yeah, take the, uh, that. The, the Put it in your part. pipe and smoke it. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm, I'm actually wanna, impressed, Barnhill. That's badass. The, Go ahead. You, I have res- we respect. But you want to do as few calculations as possible to get to your final result because that's less load on the ECU. So if all I do is make up the only table I make says how efficient my air pump is, and everything else is in calc- a basic calculation on a single equation from an input. Now Oops. we know, hey, our air density is this, our volumetric efficiency is this. So we've got a VE table and we've got a commanded AFR table. And and from the perspective of writing or developing um, models for this, that's the simple way to do it that works really good. Right. And that's that's why yeah. um, that's the, the, from an engineering physics standpoint, that's the quickest, simplest, most accurate way to calculate it. Are there other ways to do it? But yeah, you're, so you've got to go versus standard STP, then you've got to do other calculations on top of it and it skews your model. So like there's a lot of things that can get baked in that way. That's why I'm a fan of manifold versus what's in the <laughs> cylinder is yep. I think the cleanest way to do it. Um, as long as we all understand why we're talking about what it is. Yeah. You know, on a turbo car. Yeah. I make more power because I have way more air than was available in the atmosphere, but that doesn't mean my engine was more efficient. In a lot of cases, sometimes the engines are less efficient because we're choking air through our Valves, you know, there, there's a lot of things we're doing that necessarily. Well, I'm not even. I, I mean, I'm not even trying to bring up the multiplication effect of manifold pressure. I mean, I was still stuck at 
you know, working on the whole deal from an NA standpoint without even bringing in density multiplication of boost. You know, and I understand that it's, it, you know, the VE table is what it is and that's what the motor does in a and then we're just adding fuel based on the density multiplication that we're tossing on top of it. right but on a know, on a motor that's are, that's na on a motor that's na you should never see more than a, on a true 100 percent accurate which we are never 100 percent accurate on a true 100 percent accurate fuel model it will never get above 100 price 100 by physics and theory alone right just the raw nature of physics says it can't be more than 100 so actually after really good we have <laughs> Because we have in, in, inaccuracies in our own personal data that we put into those things, because you can only be so many decimals accurate and it can only do so many calculations per second, that's where we get the inaccuracies that lead to slightly higher numbers than 100%. And if you take a boosted engine, you'll see on ones that have a more accurate fuel model overall, you don't gain a whole lot as the boost goes up. You might gain a little bit, again, because of our personal inaccuracies of putting data into things, but you'll see where it'll level off and it'll stay at that number from say two pounds of boost to 40 pounds of boost where it says it's 102 VE the whole way up with, and it's accurate. You know, you'll see that in a boosted engine with one that's really, really close to a correct model. It might go up a little tiny bit again, because of our own human errors that we put into the ECU, but the model on the math would make it stay exactly at the same amount the whole way. So, the best way to explain this, and I actually went on a rant a day or two ago to a buddy of mine who's a, uh, actually he's a mechanic fabricator, drift guy, a Turbo LS Mustang, uh, same guy I was telling the story about earlier, actually with the YouTube channel. Um, he's a big physics fan, and we always talk about entropy and enthalpy and basically energy, and I won't go down that road, but basically no system can be 100% efficient. You can't get something for nothing. You can't make more energy than you put in. Um, right something always goes to, to waste, to heat, something like that. So your engine can't produce more work than it, it can move. So like you need, you can't move more air than the engine's capable of moving more or less um, from a pure physics volume standpoint. You know, there's a lot of other things going on and that makes it look like, yes, we have 100%, more than 100% VE. Um, but yeah, we can get really close. Um, but I think the best explanation, because I was ranting to my buddy about this, is like, hey, I've explained this a million times. And in this case, actually, uh, Scott Clark, you'd be you happy with this. It was someone that tagged me in a spark plug reading post about, oh, this is the LS tuner you need to talk to. Oh, no! I was like, why the spark fuck did you reading. tag me in a spark plug hey. reading post? But everyone was telling this dude he had too much timing because there was heat in the base of the spark plug. And I'm like, well, no, you're all automatically wrong. Yeah. But just from a, a heat standpoint, the reason that's wrong is if you're running too much timing, you're creating a lot of mechanical energy. It's just the wrong time. You're using that mechanical engine energy to rattle your piston. If you've got too little timing, your combustion's happening after peak pressure and it's not being converted to mechanical energy. Right. Well, I still burnt all this fuel. It has to go somewhere. Where does it go? Heat. That's why you have high EGTs with low timing. Look at but how that was basically so everything happens. This. <laughs> everything heat has to go from hot to cold it never goes the other way around right and you can't you can't produce more energy than you consume so entropy there, and entropy is. basically and the best the, when when we're ranting about hey how do i explain this to people smash a plate on the floor now tell someone to put that together with less energy than it took me to smash the plate hey. it's just not possible yeah, so Brian, I think the thing you're running up against in, in the discussion here, and, and John is pointing this out, and I'm going to agree with him on this, is when we tune highly efficient, naturally aspirated engines, and this is what NASCAR does, and this is what a lot of mm -hmm. entities do, there are bands in the RPM range where due to things like Heimhold resonance and other stuff like that, we get more cylinder filling than the simple evac you know the the suck bang whatever that series of sequence is then what we would get by simply evacuating the cylinder to a certain amount and pulling the air back in and that's where i think people get tripped up on this you know ve and where ve can be so when kazi talks about you can get yeah a, so i guess yeah so i want right. to sure be careful and with that because i've talked that about it before and i've never said there's never 100 percent ve 
Yeah, yeah. So, and in those cases, what basically happening is you're having, we're not a closed system. I guess that's the best way. The engine of itself can't produce higher than 100% VE, but it's not a closed system. So Helmholtz and stuff like that, we've got other factors playing there. So we've got atmospheric conditions and, you know, moving air and stuff like that. So, you know, in a really good engine at that point, yes, it's possible. In 99% of the stuff any of us are going to see, you're never going to see over 100% uh, because of what well, it takes to get it. thank God you at least freaking admitted that he can <laughs> fill a cylinder more than its volume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Based I, on I that. You Sorry, can I, run I but you can't. But you can't. You can't actually fill a cylinder oh, with the, the 100, cc, 100 cubic inches, more than 100 cubic inches of air. You can no, just increase that's not the density. Right. That's not right because, yeah, yeah. You <laughs> well, no, no, no. So, but the, uh, that's wrong. not it's, uh, once wrong. Again, it's not just volume. It's it's mass of air per volume. They're talking about and mass, not the volume. The engine by itself can't just do that. Yeah, it can't suck Big that difference. Right. Yeah, mass versus volume. Exactly. That's the big difference like, in the wording. Yeah, have, true volumetric guys, efficiency is volume, not mass. Yeah, yeah but, but that's not what right. we're trying It's not to called mass efficiency. Well, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's I, I, I not what we're there. doing when we add fuel to the air, to the amount of air, which is what, the whole yeah. so, part of the conversation. No, no, no. Hold on, What Bill. we care about is is how much mass, had the, 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 the density of, or the, the mass, I guess it, it's both, both matter. Let me it's try it this way. It's how much so Bill, if you're going to get more than 100 cubic air. inches of atmospheric air in a 100 cubic inch cylinder, then you're going to have to compress it to make it all fit. And you've increased the density, yeah, but then, not the volume. But, yeah, see, which which the which you've effectively that, done. Yes, you have, but it, you didn't change happens. the volume of the cylinder. I mean, literally. Yes, it, it does. You, it, yeah, you didn't change the volume. You changed the density. Rare. You got it. Evans but, has got this figured out, man. And it's funny. He's. he's I, yeah. I'm sorry. It, I know, I'll say it again. Too. All means all, and that's all. All means. I okay? used to argue. You can't the put opposite. more than all of it in there. I used to argue so, the opposite until I worked yeah. with some of the Woodward guys on, on the, some of their models and they were showing me and they're like, no, dude, this is, this is how the models work, man. This is how yeah, the, for uh, the most part, your, <laughs> your manifold. Well, so I think your manifold should, the like Hemmelt's resonance and stuff like that should show an increase in pressure in your manifold. The it does. problem is I it don't does. think it actually does it that much. No. So on, let me tell you. It, so here's the deal on yeah. the combustion pressure. Analysis is it measurable? We I guess. Listen, are, are we listen, in the, are we listen. so, are we, we more in a transient area at that point? No, though? when we do combustion pressure analysis, we'll put a, a port pressure sensor one inch in front of the intake valve. And what you'll see is you'll see these riding uh, pressure spikes above atmospheric. And yep. when the valve closes and there's an inertia or a column of air coming behind it and the valve closes, you get a pressure build, okay? Which means your air is more dense than atmospheric pressure. Um, more oxygen Ooh. molecules in that given same space. What you try to do is time that scavenge exhaust pulse and the and the incoming pulses to where the the negative pressure on the exhaust during overlap is peaked and the positive pressure on the intake is peaked. That's how you get an engine master's challenge engine that makes what you feel is 110% VE. You're actually getting 110% of atmospheric air pressure. You're getting 110 cubic inches into that 100 cubic inch cylinder is what you're doing of and atmospheric you're, well, air. You're right. let, the engine is yep. so efficient that it can create boost in the <laughs> cylinder yep. based on the yeah. pressure yes. pulses and increase the density. So the, the point intake. there is that boost shows up in your map sensor. So if you did oh, it by yeah. straight normal VE, it your map show sensor up. should measure that. Uh, but the map yeah, sensor you, usually you won't catch those pulses because the they happen that, in the column in the uh, just engine in the port. will show 105, 108 kPa. Yeah, but the only, yeah, like but you're yes. not going to see it on a map sensor. You, you would. This is a localized deal in the intake. If your map sensor itself. was reading fast enough, technically you should. But yes, no, 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 I, don't, I, don't, I don't think, think so. Because I don't think the pressure pulse will be that far away. The pressure wave generally doesn't get extended in the column. The pressure wave doesn't usually extend. Yeah, you have too much plenum. You yeah, you'd have to have yeah. a map sensor in each port to be able to correct. pick that up. Right? So, Julie is correct. What would show what this would show up on is if you're doing something like an Mtron mass, a throttle mass flow, yes. where it would catch uh, yeah. that. Or, I'm gonna pause you guys real fast. Jay Blanchard just wants everyone to know that Barnhill is up out of his chair and up in the face of the camera. Everyone better be on their game. Continue. I ain't scared of no damn engineer. He can get up in, he can get up in there. I ain't scared. No, you, you are. You are. So that, and that's the problem. That's what I've always, like, 
it's one of those <laughs> like you're not you, you are correct Bewley. you're you're going to create more air in the cylinder but yeah it, and, and that's, that's what i'm saying I, the problem there's... is that doesn't mean you should reference standard temperature pressure it's still versus the manifold because that the air was in the manifold the problem we have now is our control system in a lot of cases can't measure that till recently and that's where gm's blended mode and mtron's throttle mass flow is very effective because it can't it's, 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 you know, it's also the reason the, the manufacturers sensor. use variable cam timing and they use variable manifold valving. This is OE right. stuff in order to trick an engine into doing things that it could not otherwise do when everything is fixed. So I, I yeah, guess, but that's I guess, just optimizing yeah. cam profiles to make it have a wider uh, power band where it's more efficient across a wider RPM range yeah. and load so, range. And I guess when you're saying map sensor, you know, there's in a throttle mass flow, you're actually going to have a pre-throttle map and a post-throttle map. So, because that, and that's where you're going to catch that. And yeah, you're not going to get it in the manifold. You're doing multiple temperatures and multiple pressures. And the in some cases you're calculating, so it's still not perfect. The engine is still only consuming a certain percentage of what's available. You didn't make the engine necessarily more efficient. You just gave it more air. Right. Now, I in mean, some you're... cases, in in an Mtron throttle mass flow, as long as it's calibrated right, that VE isn't going to change. You just got more air and the ECU measured for it. In most cases, and you know, I'm not even sure in anything outside of Mtron, Motec, I'm not even sure if Cyvex does throttle mass flow. Um, yeah, it's going to show up as, as over, if the engine was 100% efficient, it's going to show up as a bump in VE because we don't have any other way to measure it. My point is always yeah, understanding most, most why the map says that. Most of us wouldn't be using a map sensor that can show positive manifold pressure anyway, right? They, you know, if they're showing, you know, we'd be lucky if they could show 105 kPa on something like that. Oh so, yeah, yeah. Well, but the problem so, is, you know, is the ram air just, effect isn't taken, isn't isn't happening in the common plenum. It's happening down at the base, right in front of the intake valve, as a uh, as yeah. the column right. It's literally down. happening within six inches of the interior of the valve job of the intake valve. Yeah, and if you and get further than that, four or five, six mass. inches away, you're you're not going to see it. Yeah, that's well, it, right again. Brian's like, coming from the perspective of guys developing the these models too, right? So I get where he's coming from, and I know Evans does too. But it, you can't change so, the volume of a cylinder. So there's there's just that's a screen showing some discussing. pressures happening there as there the go. piston moves and valves open. You can see this is software that is widely used. It's a it's a pretty good engine calculation software. You fill in the right data, it spits out a number that's pretty close. This part of the, the equation showing the, the pressures going up and down is the kind of thing that you can see with that combustion sensor. When you look at the pressures inside and you can see the pressure waves, you're seeing this exact kind of thing happening here. Which app is that? All right, and you can see them go up, go down. Uh, engine analyzer uh, by performance trends. Gotcha. So it works. Works really, really nice for seeing and understanding these kind of things. Lots that's and where, lots of data if you fill in all the stuff. That's how John designed his cam, desktop dyno. He sits and punches numbers all day. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna fly. Yeah, I, I think the, the takeaway here is understand what your numbers mean rather than just plugging them in blindly. Boom. And using a modeled version, whether it's throttle mass flow or whether it's a system that you know, in most systems, yeah, you, you're not going to get 200% V. That's way wrong. But 110, 120 in a system that, that can't do throttle mass flow, yeah, that I could see that in, a, in what's an otherwise very accurate model. You guys put my dog to sleep, just so you know. T-Rex the Weimaraner is like, fuck, that was boring. Yeah, my dogs are passed out, too. My wife's asleep, so. <laughs> right? Like I said, my, my wife she says she knows who the hours. kid's going to come talk to when they can't sleep, so. Evans, just so you know, while it looked great on Ring Central, the video looks like you yeah, I'm top. seeing it. Yep, just so you know. That's okay. You can still see you can still see the pressures moving right there. So that's that's the idea. That looks like '60s porn to me. <laughs> here we go. Something with my screen here. We'll, we'll, it's my I'll screen capture. Twenty-five percent of the screen there. <laughs> here, Evans. Yeah, so I guess the thing here is. Uh, this is why you run map sensors, EMAP, pre-map, everything, all the sensors, and the ECU to run all the sensors. All the data. We actually maxed out a KV-8 today, like completely. 
to the point where I have okay, to figure out where to bring in another that, input. Mr. I'm, I, I'm at that point on mine. I'm, I'm searching for ways to add more stuff to it. It's going to end up being the, at some point, a CAN bus input. Yeah, I'm already doing that with wide bands now. I, I got them all added in. I got a little bit of wiring left to do for power and and uh, I got to configure it, but I now have eight wide bands through CAN bus wired up to go into the Mtron. Whatever you do, don't Google 1960s porn for a picture to put behind your head on this thing. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we probably better. That's not do pretty that. funny. <laughs> it is, but we probably better not try to do that. <laughs> don't don't Google that. that. Don't do it. Man, it's already ten oh five. We got to wrap this stuff up. Anybody else? The questions winding down. My dog's falling asleep. I got to get I ready for this class. Just this laughing weekend. at our arguing. Yes. Are you guys? Uh, hopefully, some of you, some of the guys for those going to the class are considering the stream. You'll have oh, yeah. these cock monkeys on there arguing. Uh, they're they're going to help moderate the Facebook group. It should be pretty badass. We have a private Facebook I'll be group. On with Sunday. Streams. There was a, a question on YouTube, Scott, for you asking, are we all professional tuners and where did we start our training and where would you go to get started in this? I'll let you have that one. Uh, man, that may almost be a better Barnhill question. So the definition of a professional is someone who gets paid for it. I, I like to say someone who makes their living at it. Um, well, uh, hold on. There's a lot of people that pay to tune now. I know that. <laughs> well, I was more. I want to say that make a living successfully at it. I mean, I, God, I do this remote tuning a lot more nowadays, and I'm I'm coming across other tuners work, and I'm just like, man, those guys. We need to figure out where they can go to learn some more. Do I? I was I was more leaning on where can they go to get started, Scott? A real tuners class, man. Is that the <laughs> setting me up to hit one out of the park, and I'm cracking duds. I tried. I really oh. did try. You yeah, know. foul ball. <laughs> <laughs> Join our stream. A live stream class would be a good way to spend 299 bucks. Man, that is cheap for 16 hours. It's probably going to be about 14 or 13 and a half hours of actual training, but um, go to realtuners.com slash product slash DFW stream, Dallas-Fort Worth class, um, or come to the class in Dallas-Fort Worth. But anyway, they're at realtuners.com. Um, worth checking out the live stream because I am going to leave that group up indefinitely. So that you can always, like like Perdido said, you're going to be able to go back. And I'll add you to it here too, Mike. But um, So that you can go back indefinitely and rewatch. We're also going to break the videos up into segments. So I'm going to do them probably in, in 45 to, to 80 minute segments. Each topic group, kind of break them up. And then give you breaks in between. We'll probably start a new video for every one of those, is, is my guess. So that you know you can break them up by getting started, getting the thing configured and getting the engine running and then, you know, tuning idle and drivability and kind of starting to work on it. Um, and then taking it all the way to wide open throttle. But you also want to check out the car. <laughs> Some of the cars we're tuning. Um, again, this Texas mile car that's coming out, they specifically said, Hey, we know you're having a class. Um, we, this is a VIP car for a VIP customer of ours. And, you know, we were told to, to bring it to your class to get it tuned. So, we're, we want to do it. And so they're bringing it and this car should be super badass. It's a late mo It's a C six or seven vet. Um, that Trey Laughlin and the guys and Andy mages built, um, super badass car, but a lot of real smart people involved in this car. And they asked us to get the thing ready for the mile. So perspective horsepower output 3000. It's got an LME motor that the, the late model engines says it's capable of 3000 plus horsepower. As it sits, I'm not speaking to that. I don't know what the and I don't know what it'll hold on Daniel's dyno. Um, I, we're, we'll take it to as far as we can get it, and then I'll show you how to put a good, safe tune in it. You know, for taking it out and making the hits. I mean, we at the at the Florida class a couple of weeks ago, we had guys laying down what 16, 18, or 1600 plus horsepower, um, and then we had a, a freaking small, you know, a, a, a 358 inch cup car motor. Uh, with a pair of twin turbos that Tom Sewell spec'd out um, that laid down over 1,500 wheel horsepower and has been 237 plus at, at the ECTA mile, which is which is way harder to do than the Texas mile. But anyway, yeah. So sign up for the, the live stream, man. It, it should be pretty cool. That uh, And you can sign up for it after the fact. I'm going to let people go ahead and just pay to get into it after the fact. I had a bunch of people ask, hey, man, can I sign up and watch it later? And I'm thinking... Yeah, yeah, why not? Uh, you can watch it after the fact. If you're live, you can interact and ask us questions. I mean, I got a mo I'm going to have a moderator there that's going to help me 
field questions from the guys in the group so they can interact with us. But should be pretty cool, man. I, we're planning a good stream. You mean that fun. guy several us, behind you? Several of us will. Yes. Yeah. Several of us will be there all day, both days, hanging out just to help answer questions. Try Very to cool. make sure they get caught when you ask. Very cool. All right. Bewley's got to use the bathroom. It's about time to roll, guys. Anybody else? Any other questions, you guys, before we wrap it up? I'll start playing the music. It's after 11 o'clock. I'm more out. I'm going to bed. Yeah, man. You need Aloha. To to for sure. For I'm, sure. I'm now trying to figure out if I technically count as a retired tuner because I now, I, at one point, I was doing it as part of a living, and I got burnt out because I didn't want to work on my own car after working on everybody else's cars. I feel so that. So I decided that, right, it, it's like, Am I technically a retired tuner? Because I did it no, for a living and now I don't. Yet. I just do it for a hobby. No, nah, you've done work, but it's recently. hobby now. You are not retired. You yet. do good work, man. You're a professional. That's what I consider it. I mean, you're technically not working at the audio stuff right now, but you're still a pro at that too. So, anyway, that's right. my thinking. Good night, gentlemen. Stick around. We'll bullshit for a little while. Everybody else, thanks for tuning in. Always appreciate you guys listening. Uh, man, what an interesting discussion tonight. So, everybody, take care. Be safe. Don't get the virus. Whatever. And I wear a mask if you want to. Man, Rocky Mountain Race Week, Matt Frost. I hope you pull something off because we will be there. We would love to help and support that. Everyone else, have a good night. Have a good weekend. We will uh, see you next Wednesday. Hopefully, we see you guys at the class coming up this weekend. You all should sign up for the live stream. It should be pretty cool. All right, everybody, have a good one. We will uh, fade to black. We out.